All right, testing, testing. One, two. All right, so y'all ready? Okay, so um, this video may go up online on YouTube. So if you all get this, I guess I will start with you all first as the viewers. Um, so uh, Shalom, I need you to put your name, to be sure. And if you have never been to my channel, this is the channel here, YouTube.com slash Jimmy Shield. Uh, don't forget to like and subscribe, hit the bell for notifications. So, um, I have something special today. Uh, I usually never really go over these days um, on the videos uh, or the holy days, uh, either one. Uh, sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. So, I decided to go ahead and do it today. Um, so, that being said, uh, once again, like, share, and subscribe. Hit the bell for notifications. YouTube.com slash Gina Deshita. Now, um, so you might hear some children making noise in the background or running around. Just just ignore that. Um, just focus on the lesson to the best of your ability. Uh, I got my family here. Um, I was with you. Say shalom, y'all. Shalom. Okay, so. We're going to go ahead and go over the lesson by and direct. So, today we have what is known as Yom Hikapori. Yom Hikapori, or you may know some people who might say Yom Kippur. So, Yom Kippori is observed not just by Jews, but it is also observed by the true children of Israel. So Yom Kippur again is or or your Yom Kippur is the atonement. So what you're going to learn today that atonement has more than one meaning. So um, atonement, as we'll learn later, it means uh, to cover, to purge, to cleanse, to put off, uh, to make reconciliation, to forgive, or to pardon. Uh, it can mean to disannul, it can mean um, mercy, to pacify. These are a few things to remember when you are afflicting yourselves during this fast until the evening of the next day. Okay, so for those of you who are not familiar with this, in short, it is a 24-hour fast, and you'll learn many reasons why we ought to still do this, even though those of us who are in the Messianic community, when I say Messianic, I'm talking about those who confess whom the world calls Jesus the Christ or Yeshua HaMashiach as their Lord and Savior or as their Messiah. All right, so remember that our Messiah is the one that made reconciliation so that we can be forgiven for our sins and brought back to the Father. As we read in Romans chapter 5, verse 8 through 11. Which, matter of fact, we're going to actually start with that. We're going to start off with Romans chapter 5. That's what I'm going to go to. Romans chapter 5. Because we know that Christ is our atonement. That's what we're going to start with. All right. Now, family, y'all know me. Uh, sometimes I shoot off scripture fast, so if I'm going fast. Just try to keep up. If you gotta look on your sister's Bible or etc. You know, but sometimes I can I can make a move. All right, so uh, Romans chapter five. We're gonna start the eighth verse. Um, for those that are watching, you got Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, and then the Book of Romans. All right, so I'll give you about five seconds. All right, so Romans chapter 5, verse 8, this is what it says. But God, or the Father, commended his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Christ died for us. So notice it says, while we were, W-E-R-E. That's past tense. And it says when we were 
sinners. And we know that sin is the transgression of what? The law. Sin is the transgression of what? The law. So when you break God's law, you are known as a sinner. So here it is. It says that Christ uh, commended his love toward us in that while we were breaking his laws, Christ died for us. That also really set in because think of the times you sin in the past. Understand that we now have an advocate. We now have a propitiation. We have an atonement for us so that you can be forgiven for your sins. If you can't be forgiven for your sins, you got the wrath of God coming on you. Raise your hand if you want the wrath of God to come down to you. Exactly. Oh, God. And if you're listening, nobody had a hand up. So, the next verse says, much more than being now. That word is now. Today. Present. At this very moment. Right now. It says, being now justified. The word justified comes from the Hebrew word zadik. And that means declared innocent. To be cleared of all guilt. In a nutshell, to be deemed as righteous. So the Bible says that being now justified by his blood. Whose blood? Christ. Because before that, you had the blood of bulls and goats, which of course could never take away sins, which we'll deal with later. So it says we are justified by the blood of Christ, the Mashiach, Yehoshua HaMashiach, or in short, Yeshua HaMashiach. So it says we shall be saved. That means redeemed. Saved from wrath. Raise your hand if you want the wrath of God to come down on you again. So understand that because we have Christ, we are now saved from the wrath. We are now saved from the wrath. Saved from wrath through him. It says, but if when we were enemies, past sins, we were reconciled. That means to be brought back. It says we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. So notice we are justified by the blood of Christ and that We'll learn later, before Christ, before we were justified by Christ, or justified by faith, we were justified by the deeds of the law. And those deeds of the law was animal sacrifice. An innocent animal had to die. Blood had to be shed so that you can be forgiven for your sins, so that you can have pardon. And that's what this day is about as well, pardon. Forgiveness. So, think of how many times in your lifetime from your youth up, you violated God. You violated Christ. And knowing that tonight, those things can be forgiven, your sins that are past. You understand that? Think about how many times you violated others or others violated you. And know and understand that you can be forgiven for your sins. If you forgive others, and that is a hard pill to swallow. But look at the good news. It's easier when you do it. So it says, much more being reconciled or brought back, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Father, Yeshua HaMashiach, or Jesus the Christ. By whom we have now, that is the key word once again in the present, by whom we have now received the atonement. So, Christ is our atonement. As I said earlier, remember that our Messiah is the one that made a reconciliation so that we can be forgiven and brought back to the Father to make an atonement for your sins. 
That's what Christ did. Now you take a moment, viewers, and you reflect on this while we afflict our souls. And we'll learn about that more as well. Now, remember I made the comment and said, I made the comment and said, um, I said, um, you can be forgiven if you forgive others. All right. So that being said, you know what? I don't even know if I can have my screen shared the whole time. But oh well, at least you listen. So we're gonna go to Matthew chapter six. That's what we're going to ask. Matthew six. Matthew 6, we'll be All right, I'll give you a few seconds. We're going to go to uh, verse 14. Okay, so Matthew 6, 14 and 15 is what the verse is going to focus on. Because all this has to do with today as well. Because I told you earlier that this day also points back to the pardon, to forgiveness. Raise your hand if you want your sins or your transgressions to be forgiven. I know I did. Even my daughter got a hand. Now, that's right, baby. Raise your hand. You want your sins to be forgiven? Let's see what it says here. Matthew 6 and 14, it says, but if, that is an important word right there, if. There is a big if in that. It says, but if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. That's also. Now, we don't remember the Bible says that sin is the transgression of the law, right? It says, whosoever committed sin transgresses also the law goes hand in hand. If you sin against somebody, you also break the law. But these same sins of trespasses or faults, guilt, the Bible says that your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Next verse. It says, but if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. So you see that? This will also be an example of loving your neighbor as yourself. Because if you love your neighbor as yourself, this is the time to forgive your neighbor. Because your salvation depends on anybody who's ever trespassed against you. Because you got to do it. You got to forgive them. It takes more energy to hold on to wrath, to anger, to malice, than just to just, than you to just let it go. Now let's look at that word forgive real quick because. A lot of people use this word forgive, but they don't really understand this word. It's kind of like there's a saying today in the church, forgive but never forget. I've heard that in church before. Yeah. Forgive yeah. So that's what you're supposed to do, forgive and forgive. But they're saying, forgive, but I ain't going to forget. Yeah. So let's look at the word forget real quick. I mean, forget. So when we look at this word here, it means to send. Now, in what direction are you sending? Away. You're sending it away. Then it says to send forth. That's what it means. Cry, forgive. There's a good one for a sake. When you forsake something, that means you totally neglect it. You totally what? Forget about it. Because you send it away. Raise your hand in your life. Raise your hand in, in for your viewers. It's supposed to be you too. Raise your hand if somebody ever made you mad. So maybe you wanted to lick back. Or you wanted to get back at them. Now if I got somebody to watch and don't know what getting the lick back means, that's revenge. That's trying to get one up back up on the person that wronged you or did you wrong that you felt like I gotta eat them bad. Or I want them to be mad like I'm mad. 
or I'm gonna make them feel this way that they make me feel this way, or I want to hurt them or harm them or maybe even kill them. Whatever it is that got you to the point where you were in your flesh and you wanted to totally last out, whether it was directly, indirectly, if you wanted to secretly get back at them, all of these things, you didn't let it go. Right? You may have gotten over it, but you never let it go. A lot of these things is even face down from trauma. A lot of people, if you're going through trauma of any kind that you haven't let go, right? Maybe you were a victim, or maybe you victimized somebody on either side. Trauma. If you look at it, it is centered around from not forgiving, from not letting it go. But raise your hand if you felt like, you know what, they did this to me, or they said this to me, maybe it's to somebody you love, maybe it wasn't you. And you didn't really let it go. And I remember the Bible tells us in Ecclesiastes 12. Let me read this real quick. I'll tell y'all that. Ecclesiastes 12, right? When you look at the 14th verse, the last verse, it says, For God shall bring every work into judgment. Somebody say every work. That means everything you need, all of your actions. God is going to bring that into the judgment. Let that sink in. Everything that you did. You probably don't remember what you had on two weeks ago on this very day. Oh, how quickly we forget, though. The Lord is going to bring every work, action, deed, your doings into the judgment. And it says, with every secret thing, so those things you thought you got away with, nobody heard you, nobody was around, nobody seen it, nobody had their eye on you, but she was sinning. You make a fool man, but you can't fool the father. He's going to bring every work into judgment. With every secret thing, whether it be good, such as maybe like charity or something like that, you help somebody along the way, or whether it be evil, bad, such as not forgiving, not letting it go. So raise your hand if you've been guilty of that. No, I a few people I want to smack, get over with. Man, you name it, your flesh. And that's okay, but it's not okay. I say it's okay because we've all gone through it, but we know what we got to do. We got to repent, and we got to forgive, we got to let it go. It wasn't we talking, children, maybe your friends, or God, past relationship, and the relationship doesn't necessarily mean with your partner. Ex-partner can mean friendship, the relationship you may have with with someone of some sort. It could have been your boss at the job or whatever it may be. Maybe they got you fired or something like that. You want to go get some get back. You remember that happened to me in 2017. You remember the lady tried to get me fired? And then she ended up getting fired. <laughs> you get what I'm saying? But I forgive her. So you have to release, send it away, let it go because your salvation depends on it. Your salvation literally depends on it. You can never be forgiven if you don't forgive. So, when we go back to the Matthew chapter 6, it clearly tells us that Matthew 6 and 14, it says, but if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father, your heavenly Father, is also your you. Listen, let's continue. You saw that Matthew 6 and verse 16. It says, more when meaning in an issue, when you fast, be not as the hypocrites. What a hypocrite is? A hypocrite. That is what? A person that says something and do the opposite. In a nutshell, teach something 
but in the hours. So it says, don't be as the hypocrite selling sad counselors. I don't know what a sad counselor is. That's an appearance. <laughs> I just, I'm fasting right now. That's a person that's looking for what? Yeah. Sympathy. What else? Pity, attention. Absolutely. Looking to be what? Seen. So it, it doesn't even come down to the fact. It just comes down to them being recognized. Recognition. Today we live in a society where everybody wants to be recognized through the war, through TikTok, or whatever it may be. People want to be recognized and seen, acknowledged. We can't let that type of mindset, that vanity, come on in into the ways of God. Even down to when it's coming to something such as praying, fasting. So, it said, for they disfigure their faces that they might, or they may appear. And go that word, appear, means to be seen, recognized. Appear unto men to fast. Really, I say to you, they have a reward. They don't have a summer to them. Ultimately, we also see that this person right here, more than likely, is not fasting. They only appear to be fast. They only <laughs> this. The people are like, oh, look at him. Well, he is really fast over there. That is a man of God. But is he really fast? No. He just wants to be seen. He wants to appear to be as if he's fast. The Lord said he got some company, and that's a reward. That is a payback for what he's done. So he would have an uh, reward. But it says, but thou, meaning you, when you fast, anoint thy head and wash thy face, that thou appear not unto me to fast. So this is not to be seen when you fast. Go ahead. What it says, of course, the Anoint. So anoint comes even from the, you know how we say Messiah? Uh, we we may say in the Hebrew Mashiach, and uh, some who have a, what they call Lasha one for dies, they'll say um, um, Hamashiach. But the word Mashiach means the dumping and the smearing of oil. So you may see, even in the church today, they may put oil on the gate and things like that. That is anointing. You get what I'm saying? So when somebody has the anointing in the sense, that means they have a pouring out of oil. Something has been poured upon them. This is, this is in the layman's terms of what that means, the actual word. All right, the dumping and the smearing of oil. Yeah, that's so if you ever look in Hebrew. Matter of fact, I'll show you all something real quick for the viewers. Um, one of my wives asks, what is the anointing part of it, uh, to the, um, anoint your head. I want to show you something. So, um, this is dealing with Cyrus the Persian. It says, Thus said the Lord to his anointing. So the Lord mentioned to his anointing. So, what does that mean? In Hebrew, we have Ko Amari Hua Lem this word here has the word Mashiach. That is the root word there in Lemshi Ko. And let's click on this really quick. You see here? Mashiach. Anointing. Let's go down. So it's usually a consecrated person. A consecrated is one who has been totally set apart. Specifically the Messiah anointed. Let's see, we can go here, a shack here. Notice it says right here, guys, to be smear, anoint, spread a liquid. So now we're going to the root word of a shack. It says smear to anoint as consecrated to anoint, to be anointed. But look down here in the strong, it says a shack, which means to rub with oil. To rub with oil. All right. Also to paint or to anoint. But we know when you paint your face, not paint like you want a wall to paint. 
but to put something on, to spread it out. So the anointing, that's what it actually means. It comes from the Hebrew word. All right, it's the same word in Mashiach. So in, in our culture, a king or a priest was given the title of Mashiach, one who is a deliverer, one who redeems the saints, was given that title. Okay. So that being said, um, now that we know, according to Matthew 6, 17, it says, but you, when you fast, anoint your head. Now we know what the anoint means, what the order. And that's one thing I do like about the language, because the language, it does give a sense of what you're reading to. So it's kind of like um, a brother who said to me today, he said, happy a talk, a happy feast. And um, as I've always shared with you all, this is not a happy time. We had a happy time. Matter of fact, I'm going to read this verse and talk about it. A uh, little bit of um, Leviticus 23 minutes. So it says, That thou appear not to be the master, to your father in the secret, and your father in the secret shall reward you for the one who you open. But we're going to go to Leviticus 23 real quick. And I'll explain why I'm saying that this is not a happy time. All right. And I get what my brother was coming from. He was saying, well, shouldn't you be happy that basically we escaped the wrath of God because some people have died off, didn't get a chance to repent, but yet we still get to live to see another day. So I get where he's coming with that because I had that mindset as well, but then as you learn the languages and you learn the words, and these words convey a message that sometimes not always fully expressed in English. So one of my things I said to him is that when you go and when you read the Hebrew language, you go back into the mindset of the author, the way the author intended it to be written. Like if I said, hey, let's eat this watermelon, but this watermelon is dying for. What does that mean? That means it is really good. You got to try this. It's, it, it is a must eat. But if I translate that and somebody in a different culture reads that, they'll read, don't eat this watermelon. I mean, let's eat this watermelon. It's going to make you die. You get what I'm saying? So the world would have a different meaning. But you all understood that it means that it was good. It was so bad. Whereas you were told. With some of them so long. But where's me things? All right, so Leviticus 23 and 23. Remember, we just went over this the other day when we were dealing with young school. Right? And we're going to kind of reflect on something here because this is one of the points I'm going to make to show that tonight is not a happy night. So Leviticus 23, it would be like the memory of Holy Elder Moshe and Moral, which is, and the Lord spake unto Moses, saying. Then it says, the very Elder Ben Yisrael, the Moral, the Kodesh, has the E, the Echa, the Kodesh, the Yed Echem, Shabbaton, the Kodesh, the Mikra Kodesh. So speak to the children of Israel, saying, in the seventh day, in the first day of the month, shall you have a Shabbat, a memorial of blowing of trumpets and holy convocation. This word, Tehuvah, is the word in focus. When looking at this word, remember we went over these things, right, God? So when we look at this word here, it says, it's like a noise. Then it says acclamation of joy. Joy. The word joy means happy, right? Also means simcha. Joy. So the blowing of trumpets was the day of an alarm, a day of a battle front. Right? It was a day of mourning. It was a day of rejoicing, a day of shouting. Is today that? No. It is the total opposite because you are going to afflict yourself. 
You're going to beat yourself down. And we'll get to this. That's nothing happy with that. Nothing happy with that. So, we we'll also know, like, even some of the Jewish people who also read Hebrew, we may not always agree with their doctrine, but the Jewish people, guys, if you listen, they have what's called um, um, the American Tima, and that means, like, um, good signature or a good finish, or um, you may hear them say, um, your mirror uh Tima Tima, which uh, would be uh, a good uh, signature finish. You know what I'm saying? Um, uh, maybe um, found in the Book of Life, so to speak. But they don't say happy. They don't say that. Because even they know from the Hebraic perspective, from the language that it was written in, it's not considered to be an occasion that is happy. So I get what my brother was saying, you know, about be happy that you not getting the wrath. But the text don't say that. And that's something we're going to get into. And I do get what my dear brother is talking about. So somebody may say that he signed the seal with the book of life. Your member of the team of the or your member of the team of the depending on if you're speaking to a male or a female. All right, so that being said, we go back to the business. And we're going to jump down to the uh, 25th verse. Leviticus 23 and 26, it says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Also in the tenth day of this seventh month, there shall be a day of atonement. So there shall be a day of atonement. Yom Atemporim. This is what I have highlighted here. But day of atonement, guys. Yom Hekipurim. Or you may hear somebody say Yom Kippur. All right? But technically, it's Yom Hekipurim. You understand that? Okay. So, then it's going to say, Kum Mikarab Kodesh Yeh Lechem. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm going to start reading Hebrew in English. Okay, well, when I'm by myself, I'll just read the Hebrew text. My bad. Um, I'm going to just start over. So it says, also on the 10th day of this seventh month, there shall be a day of atonement. It shall be an holy convocation to you. Now, holy convocation comes with this word, mikra kodesh, mikra which is going to be the convocation, Kodesh. It's so, holy. Let's look at this word, Mikra. This word, Mikra, is where you see convocation. And it means a reading or a calling together. Simple. This is what we're doing right now. We're simple. We're reading, right? Something called out a public need, like what we're doing now. The act of persons or the place. But it also means a rehearsal. A rehearsal. Now, in order to perfect something, you have to practice. You have to have rehearsal. When we were in a choir, they have what? Choir rehearsal. Why do they do that? If they can already sing, they got to practice. Same with us. We rehearse. So, a calling together convocation or a meeting. All right. So, um, for those of you who may be watching this, who study the Hebrew language, we have what's called um, the um, Nikudot, uh, which is the dots, dashes. And we also call what's called the Matrix Lectionis. Now, if you don't know Hebrew, you just regard this. But those who do know the Hebrew language, we have. In Korea, in or Ima means what? Mother. All right, so we can in Korea, it just means the mother of reading, the mother calling out, it's the same root word that you see there. All right, so that's just to kind of paint a picture of what I'm actually expressing. But again, if you don't know the Hebrew language, I'm just asking you totally just disregard what I just said because it means 
absolutely nothing to you, and it probably means nothing of what we need to see about. Uh, so we're back in Leviticus 23. Then it says, and you should do no work in that same day, for it is a day of atonement to make an atonement for you. For whatsoever soul it be that shall not be afflicted in that same day, he shall be cut off from among his people. God. And what soul and soul that doing any work in that same day, the same soul will I be sure from among his people. God. You shall do no manner of work. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations in all your dwelling. So before I even fully explain what we just read about afflicting your souls, right? So this is what we commanded to do. To afflict your soul. Raise your hand if you didn't understand that. Raise your hand if you do. So before we even dive into that, because that's what this is about. Afflicting your souls. There's a few more things I want to grab. And then we'll come back to Leviticus 23. And we'll get the full understanding of what is being conveyed in this message. Amen. <laughs> amen. Amen. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with saying amen. It is so. You agree. Nothing wrong with saying that. When you guys are sick of the church, we can say amen too. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Amen. So, that being said, we're going to go to um, Matthew 18. Matthew 18 is where we're going to go. We're going to read 21 to 35. Because we're still in the forgiveness part. Matthew 18, 21 to 35. I want to shout something <laughs> All right. So Matthew 21 and 18. This is about forgiveness. So it says, Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how often, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Now I think about this right here. This got to be coming from somebody that would be saying, like, hey, man, how many times I got to forget this person that got a hold on me? You mean to tell me I got to keep forgiving him? Because you know your flesh, you want to last out, right? So the question is asked, how often shall I sell my brother sin against me and I forgive him? So seven times? That's the question that he's asked. How often? Right? I need a second word. Let me make sure I heard that right. And to read that. What does that mean? Matthew 18, 21. Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me? And I forgive him. Till seven times. Till seven times. Jesus said unto him, I say not unto thee, until seven times, but until seventy times. <laughs> He's asking, should I forgive him seven times? Yeshua did say unto him, I say not unto them for seven times, but until 70 times seven. That's 490. 490 times. So it says, therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like it. Like it. That means compared to. Raise your hand, you want to get to the kingdom. This is what the kingdom of heaven is compared to, or like it. Like it unto a certain king, which should take account of his servants. I'm going to give a bit of a spoiler alert. We technically will be the servants, and we know who the king is. It says, verse 24, and when he had begun to reckon, one was brought to him which owed him 10,000 talents. He owed him money. Raise your hand if you heard of somebody ready to get at somebody because they didn't pay what they owe. See that? It says, 
And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought to him was owed 10,000 talents, verse 25. But as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold, and his wife and his children and all that he had, and payment to be made. Think about this for a second. He owes some money and basically was just thrown into captivity or prison until he made the payment. Now, realistically, can he make that payment? No. He's been held against his will. Whole family has to pay. Since the servant of fool fell down and worshiped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me. I will repay thee all. He's like, look, I'm going to have you that money by next week. That's why I do. Have some patience with me, Lord. Now, if you are watching this and never heard of anything like that, you, you don't know nobody that did that. Well, maybe you were the person that owed. Maybe you owed a bill collector. You gave. Have patience with me. I'm going to have your money next week. And they show you some compassion. You get what I'm saying? But then turn around, you go to somebody else. Somebody else owes you. And you have no compassion. You get what I'm saying? So, Verse 27, the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him, and he let him go and forgave him the debt. He forgave him. He was moved with compassion for the servant, right? He was able to go, right? But now we're going to read the same story or a different story with the same man who was let go, right? He was forgiven. From his Lord, right? But after he was forgiven, something happened. What did he do? The same man that was forgiven, somebody had compassion on him. What did he turn around and do? Let's see. It says, but the same servant went out. Same dude. And found one of his fellow servants. Now that means he's the Lord now. And now he got servants. It says was owed him a hundred pence. Now, think about something here. This person, it says a hundred pence, right? But remember, according to verse 24, he had owed 10,000 pounds, right? This person owes him a whole lot less. That would be like you owe $10,000 to somebody, right? And then somebody forgave you with that 10K. But then you turn around and somebody owe you just a hundred dollars. Right? So it says, and found one of his fellow servants was owed him a hundred pence and laid hands on him. He whooped his behind. Put hands on you over a hundred dollars. Well, it's not a hundred dollars, I'm just put it in the sense of the day. You get what I'm saying? You owe somebody 10K today, man, they kill you. Right. One of the wives said, you can get mad over $20. Yeah. So, it says, he laid hands on him, and look at this, and took him by the throat. Then he choked him out. And look at what he told him. Pay me what you owe. I need my money. Gee, that dude wasn't playing with him. He was not playing. Beat dude down, choked him out, and let him have it. Jeez. So, but it's funny how we can look at this lab, right? But look at the next verse, though. It says, And his fellow servant fell at his feet and besought him, and he begged and urged him, saying, Have patience with me. I will pay thee all. That's the same thing he told. That's the same thing the dude who told him this. He told us to do who he owed money to. And let's see if he have the same compassion on his servant as. His Lord had compassion on him. Let's see. Because he was forgiven. And now somebody's asking him to forgive them. Right? Got that? So, here we go. Verse 30. And he would not. I mean, he wouldn't going to have patience with him. He would not. But what did he do? It says, but went and cast him into prison. Locked him up 
until uh, until you pay the debt. How can you pay the debt if you locked up? That shows you how he had no pity, no compassion, and didn't care. It satisfied him seeing him in the cage. Now check this out, though. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very, very sorry and came and told unto their Lord all that was done. And told unto their Lord. This is Christ right here. They would be like they went to go pray. What would happen? You viewers as listening. Another indication, you better be careful how you come on in, how you treat men of God. Because if you don't, they serve and go and pray. Oh, we guess what I have? Let's see. So I got some more family walking in, and we're going over uh, Matthew 18, and we're talking about forgiveness. Forgiveness. Raise your hand if you want to be forgiven for your sins. No, I didn't. So, the next verse in uh, Matthew 18, 32, it says, Then his Lord, after that he had called himself to him. This is what the Lord said to this man. The man was forgiven, and he had an opportunity to forgive somebody else to show the same compassion that was given to him, he wouldn't forgive him. And now since he did not want to forgive, look at what Christ said to him. Then his Lord, um, after he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt because you desired me. Like, I, I forgave you because you asked me to forgive you. But now here it is, this person, we in Matthew 18 and 31, I'm at 32. He didn't show the compassion that he should have shown. And because he did not show that compassion, the Lord called him wicked. The Lord called him wicked. To then his Lord. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, facts. So get it. So, and we lie too. So it says, um, verse 32, Then his Lord, after that he called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt because thou desired. You know, come on up here. I'm going to have you put it next. It says, um, should thou not also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as or just like I had pity on thee? That's a question that he's asking. And his Lord was wrong. That means he was angry and delivered unto him to the torments. Wow. So because he did not forgive and he didn't show compassion to somebody, and he's the same person that asked the Lord for forgiveness. Man, that bless you gets you put to death. You cannot have his mindset going and talking. Because if you get you put to death. Forgiving is critical. It's hard to forgive. I won't lie to you. But you got to do it, because that's what does say in the Lord. That's what does say in the Lord. If you don't forgive, you won't be forgiven. Matter of fact, grab Matthew 6 and 14. So it says, should I not also have compassion on our fellow servant, even if I had pity on thee? And his Lord was wrong and delivered him to the torments. Why should thou? that he should pay all that was due to him. Wow. That's called judgment. Righteous judgment. Then it says, so likewise, meaning just like. If y'all thought that was something, the Bible says, just like 
shall my heavenly Father also do one to you. Y'all see that? If you from your hearts, that's the key word, your minds, forgive not everyone his brother their trespasses. So if you don't forgive everybody their trespasses in your heart, because you know your mouth can say one thing, but the Bible will say something else. I forgive such and such, but look at your actions, though. Look at how you're moving. It can be seen that you ain't forgiven. But it's all good, though, because the Lord got something for you on judgment day, though. He got something for you. You will have your reward. You're going to be tormented and say, you can pay. Say, you want to do that. So Matthew 6 and 14, let's go back to that real quick. Matthew 6 and 14, let's get it out. Oh, let me alert some viewers here too. Matthew 6 and 4 and 14 is what we had one of the verses here. Go ahead, Jimmy. Matthew chapter 6, verse 14. Let's get it. For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. So that's the if in that. If you forgive men of their trespasses, there's an if. Your heavenly Father will also forgive you. That's the if, though. Raise your hand. You want to be forgiven of your trespasses. Raise your hand and you forgive everybody that you've done wrong or did you wrong, etc. You get what I'm saying? All right, let's get it. Verse 15. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses. See that the Bible says that you do not forgive men of their trespasses. What does it say? Neither will your father forgive ye oh, your trespasses. Stipulation. Your father's not going to forgive you of your trespasses. So let's go to the apostles. And we're going to grab Ecclesiasticus, also known as Sarah. Now, for those of you that are watching, check this out. Um, the Apocrypha is not an addition to the Bible. It is a part of the original King James Version of the Bible, which was authorized to be translated in the year 1611. So when the King James Bible was authorized to be translated in the year 1611, you had 47 of the best Hebrew and Greek scholars came together to put the Bible together. Two groups for the Old Testament, uh, three groups for the Old Testament, two for the uh, no, three groups for the Old Testament, two for the New, and one for the Apocrypha. All right. So in short, uh, I do have a documentary called Apocrypha on Trial on my old YouTube channel. I did about maybe almost ten years ago, something like that. But anyway, you have a 1611 edition in the Book of Ecclesiasticus, and some some version of the Bible, like the NRSV, it was a Sirach, not like the drink though. So we're going to Ecclesiasticus, not Ecclesiastes, but Ecclesiasticus. And don't worry, if you don't have it online, you can see right here at kingjamesbible.org um, slash apocryphal books. This is how you can find it online. All right. So we're going to Ecclesiasticus, and we're going to go to chapter 28. Now, I just gave one of my brothers this question the other day. Uh, good good brother of mine, man. Shout out to my brother, Tim, man. He had used it. Uh, he had wanted to get his lick back for some brothers that got over on him. And I was telling him he had to forgive. He was like, man, F that. But then when I said to him, he's kind of, he was like, Jack, you're right. I got to do that. I got to forgive him. He didn't make no excuse. And that's one thing I would say to him if you watch this, uh, bro. You didn't make no excuse about it. I know you want to get get back. I know you want to go back and get it with God. But so when I gave him these passages, he stood down. He stood down. And that's what we ought to do as God-fearing men and women. We stand down. You have to humble yourself. One of the words for humble is for shiak. And it's spelled with a shin and it has a cake in it. Shin Pictograph is a D. The faith is a fence or wall. So in order for you to be humble, you break down the wall. And that's what we have to do. We have to, what we say, let your guard down. Your guard is that wall. So in the Hebrew language, these words mean things. It is the breaking or the destroying of the wall. And that's one way to humble yourself. You can't do that if you have a wall up. 
Oh, that's right. You don't call it that. You call it a guard. If you got your guard on. And Lord knows you know, to have that for you. You say it's on the song as well. So we're gonna go to Ecclesiastes. We're going to chapter 28. We're going to read and we're going to start in the first verse. We're going to read one through eight. Ecclesiastes, hold on, one. Chapter 28. Verse 1. Mm -hmm. Ecclesiastes, uh -huh. chapter 28, verse 1. Let's get it out. Hello, everybody there? <clears throat> okay, cool. Let's go. He that revenges shall find vengeance from the Lord. Mm. He that what? He that revenges shall find vengeance from the Lord. So if you find vengeance, right? Mm. What is it? Shall find vengeance from the Lord. So if you revenge, you got revenge somebody you God. That go for your family, friends, who else? Read that verse one more time. He that revengeth shall find vengeance from the Lord. Come on with and he will surely keep his sins in remembrance. You see that? Just like we just read in Matthew 18, so 1 to 35. Mm -hmm. Your sins will be remembered. Your Lord just said, if you want your sins to be forgiven. We just read it in what we call the so called New Testament. We also read it right here in the Apostles. We just read it in Matthew 6, 14, 15. Matthew 18, 21 to 35. And now we're reading it right here in the Ecclesiastes 28. Continue, brother. Forgive thy neighbor the hurt that he have done unto thee. Sound like what I asked you earlier. How many times, well, who can raise their hand and say, I have been hurt by my fellow or my neighbor? Raise your hand. What the Bible say you got to do? Forgive thy neighbor the hurt that he have done unto thee. Anybody that's going to hurt you, you must forgive. Your name, your salvation will rely on you. Forgive, we just learned earlier, it needs to release, to send their way, to let go, to let it be. Forget about it, meaning it never happened. But oh man, what happens? That flesh can go. Those thoughts start creeping in your mind. Or what if Johnny didn't forgive me? What if Johnny do this? Or what if they say this? Or what if they act like that? Well, you don't worry about Johnny. You worry about thou. You. Because your salvation, your salvation lies on it. Where is it if you want salvation? You got to forgive your neighbor. One more time, Ron. What do you say? Forgive thy neighbor the hurt that he have done unto thee. So shall thy sins also be forgiven when thou prayest. Mm. Let you know that when you pray and ask for forgiveness, you won't be forgiven. If you have not forgiven your neighbor for that hurt that they caused you. Man, that's deep. Let's continue. One man bear of hatred against another. Right. And no, hold on. Wait a minute. Let's read that one more time. Verse three. What does it say? One man bear of hatred. One man what? One man bear of What's hatred. What's that word? Bearing. That means carries. One man bearing a carries. That's a burden that he's carrying with him. But what type of burden? It's about to tell you in the next word. What does it say? Hatred. Hatred. This is a person that is carrying hate, hatred against him. another. And what else? And doth he seek pardon from the Lord? You tell him this person trying to seek pardon or forgiveness for the Lord. Remember, we learned earlier, as I told you earlier, when we in atonement, it has more than one need. One of those words means to pardon. So today, is the day when you pardon or you view it that you kept it yesterday or the day or whatever day you may be keeping it. This is the day when you will pardon or the day when you pardon others because your salvation relies on that. If you're saying things like, oh, I forgive Tommy, 
see no, but then you turn around and still not get ignorant toward them. You got bad body language toward them or nonchalant. Look, let me stop sharing my screen. The Lord see through that. I forgive such and such, but look at your body language. Look how you're talking to that person. Look how you deal with that person. You didn't really forgive. You didn't really forgive. Because when you forgive somebody truly, you let it go. And you act as if it never, ever happened. So if there was somebody, maybe a friend, a co-worker who's done you wrong, you remember that friendship God used to have before you forget, before they trespass against you? You know if you feel that way, if you go back to that. If you don't, you didn't forget. You didn't release. That means you can't be forgiven for your sins. Anybody understand that? Think about it. As I was saying earlier, friends may have done you wrong. Spouse may have done you wrong. Family may have done you wrong. Guess what? You got to do what? Forgive. You can't carry that hurt. Can't carry that hate. If you're not ready to do that now, atonement is not for you. It's not for you. And if you're watching this, if you're guilty of it, fast again. So that you can do atonement right. Let's continue. Verse 4. He showeth no mercy to a man, which is like himself. So no mercy to somebody that's just like himself. What else? And doth he ask forgiveness of his own sins? Man, you got some more there. Oh. If he that is but flesh nourish hatred, mm -hmm. who will entreat for pardon of his sins? Read that again. If he that is but flesh nourish person that just slept with blood on human being, right? Nourish hatred. That type of verse said nourish. Hey, nourish. It's like the Bible talked about nor uh nourishing your flesh, right? This is nourishing hatred. Then it asks a question. Who will entreat for pardon of his sins or his trespass or his transgressions? Verse 6, what does it say? Verse 6. Remember the, thy end and let enmity cease. Let enmity cease. Strike. Hatred. Cease. Stop. Cut off. What up? Remember corruption and death mm -hmm. and abide in the commandments. Abide in what? In the commandments. Uh -huh. Remember the commandments and bear no malice to thy neighbor. You see that? It's like when we even learn that Passover. Can't have Passover. Can't keep Passover with malice in the heart. But it says, and bear meaning carry no malice to your neighbor. Malice means you want to hurt or harm somebody. Don't have it to your neighbor because uh, eventually that's going to lead to death. Put that person in one of all you. So it says, remember what? It says, remember the commandments. The covenant. In, oh, it's all good. Oh, okay. Remember the covenant of the highest. And what else? And wink at ignorance. So remember the covenant of the highest. And the Bible says, wink. At ignorance. Who knows what that means to wink at ignorance? Raise your hand if you know what that means. Wink at it. Ah, uh, whatever. Just let it go. Brush it off. Like what Christ says, forget them, for they know not what they do. Now, hold this in the book of my breath, Acts 17 30, real quick. Y'all stay where y'all at. I want him to grab Acts chapter 17 and verse 30, because the Bible says, in this Ecclesiastes 28 and 7, it says, Remember the commandments and bear and carry no malice to your neighbor and remember the covenants of the highest and wink at ignorance. That sounds real familiar to me because God does that with us. Acts 17, verse 30. Acts 
chapter 17, verse 30. Let's get that. In the times of this ignorance. The Bible says in the times of this ignorance. God winked at. What did God do? Winked at. You see that? God does it with us. At the times of this ignorance, God what? God winked at. Come on. But now command of all men everywhere to repent. The Lord command men everywhere to repent. It comes from the Hebrew word tashu. It means turn. You do a 180. Not a 360, a 180. You turn from your past crime, your past ways, your past life. And one of the ways we're going to be doing that is through fasting today. So let's go back to uh, the Apocrypha. Let's read verse 8. This is Ecclesiastes chapter 28, verse 8. Come on. Abstain from strife. Do what? Abstain from strife. Stay away from strife. Because that's going to lead to what? Sin. Sin. So, let's continue. And thou shalt diminish thy sins. Mm. You'll be diminishing and taking away your sins. What else? For a furious man will kinder strife. A kindle means to ignite. That man that is spirit, that anger, that is going to kindle strife. Matter of fact, John that grab Ecclesiastes, regular Ecclesiastes, chapter 7, real quick. So, Ecclesiastes 7. Look, you please, what chapter uh, verse? Chapter 7 and um, Ecclesiastes 7 and is the uh, yeah, um, book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 7. Oh, look, that's what I did. Are oh, y'all ready? Oh, okay, so my page is turned. Uh, seven and twenty. Come on. It's the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter seven, verse twenty. For there is not a just man upon earth that doeth good and sinneth not. Look, we know that we got things to work on, right? We know that it's not a just man upon earth that doeth good and sinneth not. They don't fall short. We know this, right? Even the Apostle Paul told us this in Romans uh, three and twenty-three. But we were talking about anger. Read verse nine. What does it say? Ecclesiastes. Mm -hmm. Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 9. Oh. Be not hasty in thy spirit. The Bible says, says, don't be hasty in your what? In thy spirit. That hasty. You know what that word hasty means? Let's go into real quick. So, the spirit of this says, oh, have I have. And that's the word for the word hasty. So, it says, Alarm, study. That there is all to be on because when you are so studying or you acting out of impulse, it's going to cause you to sin. Um, it's kind of like I hate to use extreme measures. You know, somebody stepped on your shoe, you got so mad you shot them. because you were hasty. You got that mad. You got that angry. You so quick to be angry, so quick to be pissed, so quick to want to get some get back. You so quick to want to show the person that you be happy, you not the one. So the scripture says what? It says, "Be not hasty in thy spirit to be angry." Go ahead. For anger resteth in the bosom of fools. Anger has a resting place. A bed and its bed is resting place or its bosom or home or in the laps of fools. Want to see a dummy or you the angry person? You understand that? He's the angry person. If you viewers are watching, listening, there's nothing wrong with swallowing these things up. Nothing wrong with swapping these things out. It's anger. 
If we can do that, be fast. We're gonna give some few examples of fasting. Um, I guess we'll start with David, Second Samuel chapter twelve. Let's go there real quick. Second Samuel. That's a MacBook. Give me a MacBook. Man. Give me a MacBook. Man. It's like they got makeup on the air, it's smooth and everything. So, got the MacBook. <laughs> and then if I, uh, I can save it in uh, different uh, formats and I can make it clear or not as well. What's that called? How much I paid for Black Dog? It was over a thousand dollars. Was over two thousand. Yeah, about three. I don't remember. But this, yeah. So everything, this or more stuff. Mm -hmm. Oh, look, I didn't figure out. Yeah. But we we'll talk about that later because I don't want to be called this brand. Do not catch you out. Yes, I did. Is touch screen? Is touch screen? So let's get it on. Second Samuel 12. All right, Second Samuel 12. Yeah, okay. All right, cool. Let's start uh, verse 14. It's the book of Second Samuel, verse chapter 12, verse 14. Mm -hmm. How be it, because of this deed that has given great occasion to, en to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. Now, this is after David. Had committed adultery. Now, according to Leviticus 20, verse 10, adultery is when you sleep with another man's wife. And uh, he com he committed adultery, slept with your wife's wife, if you read the chapter before this. And this is after, well, this is when David uh, had a visit by Nathan, who was a prophet and a mouthpiece of the Lord. And this is after he uh, got caught up, well, he got confronted by Nathan. And then it was talking to him. Go ahead. Verse 15. And Nathan departed unto his house. Right. And the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife bare unto David. You see that? She slept with David. Come on. And it was very sick. Mm -hmm. David therefore besought God. What did he do? Besought God. He begged of God. For the child. For the child. And David fasted. And went in and lay all night upon the earth. David fasted, right? So in the Hebrew text, um, there's something I want to point out. Verse 16, right? Yeah. So um I see the word um like your song, this word here. Um it has the root word zoom. And when you look up fast, it says to abstain from food. Fast, right? Abstain means to refrain from or keep away from it. But then it goes on to say, soon, the word that we're looking at is a primitive root. It means to cover over the mouth. Now, if you cover your mouth right now, what can go inside your mouth? Nothing. So that lets us know that fasting, short fasting means nothing, or in this sense, nothing going in your mouth. Nothing. Heavy on the word nothing. And the reason why I have to shut this is because my viewers make comments say, but well, what if I wanted to? Nobody tries to look for a loophole to way out than the evil. We always try to find a loop out. I get these questions almost every year. What well, can I do this? Can I do that? Be quiet. If you cover it, look, if you don't understand by now, you look the word fast up and you see it means to abstain from food, but it also the word means to cover as in you cover your mouth. My question is, what can you put in your mouth if you cover it? Whatever answer you got with, that's what you do. So David fasted. Read that verse one time. Verse 15. Come on with it. Second Samuel 12 and with uh, the 15th verse. 
In Nathan I mean, 16, 16 mm -hmm. it says, uh, David therefore besought God for the child, and David fasted and went in and lay all night upon the earth. Second Chronicles 20, verse 3. Let's go to that real quick. The book of Second Chronicles, chapter 20, verse 3. And Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord. You see that? Jehoshaphat said he feared and he set himself to seek the Lord. What did he do? And proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. So the Bible said that the Hebrew word, um, um, like a whole by Yikarah Zoom. All calling it to God. So this word here by Yikarah, that means to proclaim, to cry out. But then he says song. That word song again comes from the same word of fasting and to fast. So right here it says fast, fast. Then it says song. Then it has it tells you that this word song comes from this word. And let's see what that word is. So the same word in which we would just add. That's why I say the primitive root, that is the root word, the song. And that means to cover over, specifically, your mouth. For example, to fast. So one more time on that verse. Remember, we're in the second chronicles, just because y'all were behind. Second chronicles 20, verse 3. Go on. And Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord. And proclaim a fast throughout all Judah. Let's get another one. Jeremiah 36, verse 6. Jeremiah 36 and 6. In the book of Jeremiah, chapter 36, verse 6. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Therefore, go thou and read in the roll which thou hast written from my mouth. The words of the Lord in the ears of the people in the Lord's house upon the fasting day. Upon the fasting day. Upon the fasting day. Come on, read. And also thou shalt read them in the ears of all Judah that come out of their cities. So in Hebrew, I see here by Yom Song, the day of fast. Or what your Bible says, fast day. So what show what it means. What does that say right there, Fast, fasting. And then it comes from the root word. Hmm. Mm -hmm. And what does that mean? A primitive root to cover over the mouth, to fast. To cover over the mouth of this fast. Now let's get a biblical example of fasting. Let's go to uh, Jonah chapter 3. The book of Jonah, chapter 3. Verse. Uh, we're going to start one. So we're going to look at uh, Jonah, chapter 3. And uh, we're going to read one through eight. Um, seven. All right. So, viewers, I know you're probably flipping your pages to Jonah, but you know what it is. We give you about 10 seconds to find Jonah. So, we want to look at Jonah. So what we call the new chapter called John Ass. The point is John. All right. So this is when um, your forefathers repented. And we're going to see what happened in the city of Denver. So we're in John chapter three, and we're going to start at the third verse. All right, let's see. Third verse or the first verse? Uh, I mean, chapter three. Verse 10. <laughs> I mean, the third chapter. It's a book of Jonah, chapter three, verse one. And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go unto Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. So go to them and preach to them, but you need to preach what I tell you to tell them. Come on. So Jonah arose and went unto Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days' journey. So you see that? It took him three days to get there. Well, he's shaking. 
three days. Come on, we, and we, we got a problem with driving 30 minutes today. <laughs> Jeez, man, come on. And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey. And he cried and said, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Mm. So that was a, he was calling that down. Look, 40 days, the city could be overthrown. Overthrown, come on. So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast. And they what? Proclaimed a fast. So they were told that the city was going to be overthrown in 40 days. They believed. And they obviously wanted forgiveness. And they obviously wanted repentance. So they ended up fasting. They proclaimed a fast. They cried out, everybody, we going to fast. We done wrong. See, and I like this because nobody made excuses. Nobody says, I mean, well, God, you know, but you ain't got to do an avoid it. I mean, technically, we, no, none of that. They recognize the error, obviously, and they fast. That's just that. You either fear God or you don't. It didn't take nobody to tell you 50,000 times to stop doing this, stop doing that. If you are, you are. Repent. Simple as that. Oh, that's right. Maybe you just don't believe the Bible. Then. Come on. So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed the fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even unto the least of them. So we see they put on sackcloth and ashes. They didn't put on the glorious garments at all. They didn't do that. And look at the word that we have here. It tells here, like it correctly. So, and it has the same root word. So, look at this. Same thing we just read, right? Cover the mouth. That means what came into their mouth, y'all? Nothing. And we're going to get an example of that. How do we really know? Because Look, I know somebody probably is evil is all I'm doing is probably watching this. Like, how do we know like really nothing came into the mouth of that? I mean, I see what it says, but like, what if <laughs> you know what I'm saying? What if always one somebody was it somebody out there? The Lord see. Let's come on, let's read. Verse 6. For the word came unto the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne. And he laid his robe from him and covered him with sackcloth and set in ashes. Come on. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles. So you see that? And he caused it to be cried out and published through all the city by the decree. This was a decree. A ruling of the king and his nobles, meaning his princes all the ruling of those with great statue. Come on. Saying, let neither, what it said. Saying, let neither man nor beast, so man or animal, herd nor flock, herd nor flock, taste anything, what? taste anything, what? taste anything. That was the fast. Don't taste anything. Nothing. Maybe somebody didn't get that, right? What does it say after that? Let them what? Let them not feed nor drink water. Let them not feed nor what? Drink water. Let them not feed nor drink what? Water. Water. Mighty and evil. No water. Read that verse one more time. This is Jonah chapter 3 and verse 7. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles. Saying, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water. So, when we're doing atonement, when we are to afflict our souls, fasting is associated with that. This is one of the reasons why I had us to get a few examples, mainly for the viewers. It's going to be somebody out there that's going to run fun of loophole. Now look, I want to give a disclaimer. If you have some sort of medical condition or something like that, taking medication or something like that, if you feel like that, 
you have to absolutely do that or something like that, and then get pregnant, anything like that. But don't, don't, um, uh, how can I put this? I'm gonna let you be the judge of that, is what I'll say. You know what I'm saying? You just do the best that you can because at the end of the day, matter of fact, grab that real quick. Jeremiah chapter 17, right quick, in verse 2. Jeremiah 17, you see, that something I want to share with that so that you can understand. Because that might be somebody out there that may not physically can't do this. All right. But those of you who are healthy, you're strong, and you're vigorous, you're courageous, you're strong in the Lord, and you're able to do this. Not the ones who are able. Shut up. Um, you're able if you're able. But remember, you can fool me, but you can't fool the most high. Because every work will be brought into the judgment and every secret thing, whether it be good or rather it be evil. So Jeremiah 17, 10, now what does that mean? It says, I the Lord search the heart. The Bible says, I the Lord search the what? Search the heart. Heart comes from the inward land or la'ah. It means your mind. So the Lord is from getting your mind. The same thing when you had those evil thoughts. Yeah, God's getting that mind. So it says, I the Lord search. When you search it, that means you look for Look it into. It says, I the Lord search the heart. What else? I try the rain. I try the rain. Spell it with rains. R E I N S. That's getting down into your intentions and your origins. Your inner parts, your inward parts. What else? Even to give every man according to his way. So you're going to be rewarded according to your works, your ways. And, and what else? And according to the fruit of his doing. The fruits of your doings. The fruit that you're producing and what you're doing, you be judged for that. So if you're a person that may have some sort of condition or something like that of some sort, look, don't get the comment and tell someone, well, what if I got this and all that? Look, you pray to God and you ask God, all right? You the best that you can, all right? Remember, this is also a rehearsal. This is a practice. You practice to get it right. And if you want to intake some food or some drink, just swallow your spit. <laughs> So read that one more time. It says, I the Lord search the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doing. So I had ended with uh let's go to Isaiah 58. Um, I talked about how afflicting your soul is associated with fast. So we're gonna go to Sefer Yeshayahu or the book of Isaiah. Verse 6. Hold on, we're going to go ahead and warn. Hold on, there we go. So, on Isaiah 58. Okay, I see the page turn. Isaiah 58. Everybody there? All right, verse 1. Let's get it. What's the first three words in Isaiah 58 and 1? Cry aloud. The Bible says what? Cry aloud. Cry aloud. What else? Spare not. That is a huge word right there. You are not to spare feelings. And look, when you yell it, crying aloud, and you're not sparing feelings, you're going to come off as mean, rude, prideful, arrogant, boastful. Magnifying yourself, whatever you use, whatever name you be called. There are people out there who don't like you today because I don't say feelings. So the Bible says, spare not. What else the Bible says? Lift up thy voice like a trump. Now, I don't know about you, I don't know everything, but I know how to read. And that says a trumpet. A trumpet is that loud. Yeah. Raise your voice. Don't spare them. And what else it says? And show my people their transgression. Oh, you didn't judge me. 
Show them their sins, their crimes, their trespasses, what else? In the house of Jacob, their sins. What else? Yet they seek me daily. So the house of Jacob, or the Israelites, the children of Israel. Now look, for those of you who are new to the Bible, I'm going to give you a small crash course in under 60 days. Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Genesis 11, verse 10 on down to 26. Shem had sons, who had sons, who had sons. Down to a man named Terah. Terah had a son named Abram. Genesis 17 and 5. Abram's name was changed to Abraham, which means the father of any nation or illegitimate. Abraham had a son. Well, Abraham was uh, given a promise that him and his seed after him, specifically the child of Sarah, whom Isaac was born of. Abraham had a son named Isaac. Isaac had a son named Jacob. Jacob's name was changed to Israel, Genesis 32, 27, 28, Genesis 35, 9, and 10. Israel, or Jacob, had 12 sons, and his 12 sons became known as the children of Israel. The Israelites, the sons of Israel, or the sons of Jacob. So when you read the sons of Jacob, pastors, this is talking about a nation or a race of people, specifically the children of Israel, the Israelites, the Jews, if you will. Now, let's go ahead and read that now and we understand that this is talking to a people, not a religion. All right, so. It says at the end of that first one, it says, in the house of what? In the house of Jacob, their sin. How talking by the least family. The family of Jacob, their sins. All right. Continue. Verse 2. Yet they seek me daily. Now we know who the youth is. Preachers, pastors, the children of Israel. They are seeking the Lord daily. And what else? In the light to know my way. They want to know his ways. They, they delight to know his ways, his path. What else? As a nation that did righteousness. So they wanted to do that as a nation that did what? Righteousness. Righteousness. Deuteronomy 6, 24, Psalms chapter 119, verse 172. Luke chapter 1, verse 5 and 6 tells us what righteousness is. It is keeping of the commandments. But what else? What did they do with this though? And what? And forsook not the ordinance of their God. And forsook not the ordinance of their God, the God of Jacob, as we're reading the Bible. Come on. They ask of me the ordinances of justice. The ordinance of justice or righteousness. What else? They take delight in approaching to God. What else? Wherefore have we fasted? Say they that thou seest not. That's a question that he's asked. What for have we fasted? Say they that you don't see. What else? Wherefore have we afflicted our soul and thou takest no knowledge? So have we not afflicted our soul or ourselves that you haven't taken knowledge of what we did? A question that is being asked. Remember that atonement, as we learned about earlier in Leviticus 23, when we were there 26 on now, is dealing with afflicting your soul. This is also associated with fast. So even during the time of Isaiah, which is about 700 years before Christ, can come in the flesh. Um, they understood this. What else it says? Behold. Anytime you see the word behold or low, that means something's about to be revealed. Kind of like when you highlight in your Bible, highlight in your Bible. Pay attention to what it's saying. Behold, what else? In the day of your fast, ye find pleasure and exact all your labor. So when you fast, what did you find out of that? Pleasure. And exact all your labor, meaning all of your work. Go ahead. Behold, ye fast for strife and debate. I understand and something. Just because you fast don't mean you're doing a righteous fast. Uh -huh. And to smite with the fist of wickedness. Come on. Ye shall not fast as ye do this day to make your voice to be heard on high. You see that? You better make sure you fast with pure intentions. You better make sure you're doing that. Come on. Is it such a fast that I have chosen? Mm -hmm. A day for a man to afflict his soul? Come on. Is it to bow down his head as a bulrush? 
and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Would thou call this a fast hmm. in an acceptable day to the Lord? Now, look, let's look at the word for fasting for us. So we have Yom Anos. So the first thing I want to deal with is the Yom Anos. Um, that's what I want to deal with because, matter of fact, so we got the Zoom, the Zoom, which is the fast. So we click on fast with the first. Same thing, right? Fast, fast, right? Comes with the same root word of the mouth, right? But the next word I want to deal with in this text is this word, I note. I note. This word is what you know in your English Bible is the word of sex, which has the root word ana. Ana. And let's see what this says. Check this out. It says ana. It says, to the idea of looking down, brow beating to be pressed, literally or a figurative, so to speak, transitive or entrance, a base. That means when you are base, that means you are coming down low. You are humbling yourself. Self afflict. See that? Self afflict. In other words, there is humble. Humble. Submit, weaken yourself. So when you are afflicting your soul, you'll learn later that you are dealing harshly with yourself. You are humbling yourself. If you in this fast and afflicting your soul, and you are not humbling yourself, you're wasting your time. There's no point in the family. I had shared y'all the disclaimer early about the kids. <laughs> y'all just said no. So Leviticus 23, let's grab it. Leviticus 23. Y'all get a free. So 26, let's get it. Verse 26. Mm -hmm. Leviticus chapter 23, verse 26. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Also on the tenth day of the seventh month, there shall be a day of atonement. It shall be a holy convocation unto you, and ye shall afflict your souls and offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. An offering of offering made by fire unto the Lord. You see right here, Yom Mikroporim, which is the day of atonement, who Mikrobach for the edge. So, it is letting us a holy time of faith, right? So, we have Yom Mikroporim. Let's look up Mikroporim real quick. As the root word Kippur, remember I told you earlier, you may hear people say Yom Kippur, right? Or you might hear some say Yom Mikroporim, all right? So, when you say Kippurim, has the root word Kippur. Right. And let's see what this word means. It says what? Atonement. Atonement. So this word before comes from this word. And let's see. The power. It means what? To cover, to purge, to make an atonement, to make reconciliation. Keep that in mind. That's going to mean something later. To cover over with pitch. You see that? Look at this, to cover, atone for sin, make atonement for, cover over, atone for sin, by person, by legal rights. Even then, coming on down, it has here uh, to cancel, appease, make atonement, to cleanse, disannul, forgive. See that? Remember, atonement is associated with you being forgiven. That's what we were going over there earlier. The Day of Atonement is also known as the Day of Forgiveness. But you can't be forgiven for your sins on atonement if you have not forgiven. It also says be merciful, pacify, pardon, curve the way to put off, make reconcile or reconciliation. This is the Day of Covering, and it's covering these sins. You understand that? 
So the day of covering deals with this. All right. So we just got to learn about that, right? Forgiveness, merciful, purge, cleanse, to pardon, forgive, merciful, pacify. Understand that, right? Okay. Let's do it. Verse 28. And ye shall do no work in that same day, for it is a day of atonement. Hold on, wait, wait. Let's go back to 27. 27. Also on the tenth day of the seventh month, there shall be a day of atonement. It shall be in a holy convocation unto you, and ye shall afflict your souls and offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. So, uh, let's see where I said, I see Isaiah, you can so this is where he is. And now, this is the word for afflicts. Afflicts. And let's see. Look at this. To be put down, to be comfortable, be downcast, to be depressed. Not depressed as in, oh my God, I'm sad. Like to the point to where you're about to, you know, where you're off with some. Right? But you're being hard on yourself. Humble himself down. The, uh, humble, afflicts, um, abates once again. You're bringing yourself down low. It's not a happy time. It's the time of self checking, judgment. Judgment. It's also associated with prayer, which we'll deal with. Later, go ahead, read this verse again. 27? Yes, yeah, one more time. Also, on the 10th day of the seventh month, there shall be a day of atonement. Day of what? A day of atonement. Come on. It shall be a holy convocation mm -hmm. unto you, and ye shall afflict your souls and offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. Come on. And ye shall do no work in the same day. Mm -hmm. For it is a day of atonement to make an atonement for you before the Lord your God. You see that? To make a sacrifice, a reconciliation of forgiveness, or a purge, or a pardon. This is the Lord you and God. And when you afflict the soul, which is bound to the human body, which is turned and fueled by food, that fuels you, that gives you energy. When you don't have food, you will lose that sense of energy. And guess what lack of food you will do? It will humble you. What if I told you that when you don't have food in your system, not only it humbles you, it makes you really look at things that's more important. Like a poor person who may not have food, he may not have much. He may look at the things like the things you complain about, oh, it's hot. Okay, well, poor person is going to eat. Oh, it's cold. Well, poor person is going to in the cold. You get what I'm saying? Things that we complain about, things that we are so ungrateful. I don't like my job. Well, poor person will have a job. Well, I don't like this car. It ain't work. Well, poor person will have a car. You get what I'm saying? And for you smarter, you get one born with that. So, we're out Deuteronomy 8 real quick, but there's something to be learned in that. Deuteronomy 8, the Lord allowed us to go home. Deuteronomy 8. Come on. Book of Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 1. Come on. All the commandments which I command these this day shall ye observe to do, that ye may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord swore unto your father, unto your fathers. And thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these 40 years in the wilderness to humble thee and to prove thee. So notice the Lord led us 40 years into the wilderness, but he did it for two minutes to humble us and to test us. He did it to humble us and to test us. Let's see it, right? So, yep, I'm in the world of my eye on uh, my nose hunt. So, it's a couple of us. And the same good word, I'm not there. 
He did it to humble us and to test us. But why though? To know what? What is that now? To prove thee and to, to know what was in thy heart. So he wanted to test us to know what was in your mind. You want to put in yourself to humble in yourselves? Oh man, you need to see what's on your mind. Come on. Whether thou wouldest keep his commandments or no. You want to know if you're going to follow his rules. Come on. And he humbled thee. He did what? He humbled thee. What else? And suffered thee to hunger. He allowed us to go hungry. Didn't feed us. Come on. And fed thee with manna. This is Exodus, the 16th chapter. And when you read the 15th verse, you learn uh, about the bread that came down. And we know that bread is associated with Christ. He's the bread of life. Come on. Which thou knowest not. Neither did thy fathers know. Right. That he might make thee know. You see that? That he might what? Make thee know. So that he might make you or cause you to know or to understand what? That man doth not live by bread alone only. So that bread, word bread it comes from the Hebrew word lech. Lech. That's what he is. Lech. Which also means what? Right. So when it's saying here that man don't live by bread only, this can also be taken as that man don't live by food only. What else? What else? What do we live by? But by every word. What? Every word. Suffers. Every word. Every word. What? That proceeded out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. A man also lives by every word and come out of the mouth of God. So when you are in a talk and you hungry, eat on the word of God. Time to go out. How to do? How often do I teach the Bible? Every day. Loud. Every day. Every day. Do I miss a day? Do I go a day without stopping and teaching or counseling people? I do this every day. Every day I eat on the word. I don't let a day go by. I don't even know if you can do watch this. How do you let a day go by and you ain't getting a Bible? You want to acknowledge God. How do y'all do that? You can comment that you believe us. Comment that. How do you go a day? How do you get too busy for God and his word? I got a lost family and make time for God every day, no matter what. But y'all are too busy. 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 Which I like to look at as busy is an acronym for being under Satan's yoke. Being under Satan's yoke, you being busy, that there is a tactic that'll bring you closer to Satan. Being busy, I ain't never too busy with God. I know about you. So here it is the Lord wanted to teach the children of Israel a lesson, and that lesson was to humble them and to test them. To know what was on their minds, whether they was going to follow the rules or no commandments or not. So read that verse one more time. Deuteronomy 83. But Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3. Come on. And he humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger and fed thee with manna, which thou knowest not, neither did thy fathers know, that he might make thee know. That man doth not live by bread only, right. but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. So a man lives by every word that come out of the mouth of God. Let's get an example of uh, this word, humble, right? You remember the story of Sarah and Hagar, right? So let's look at Genesis chapter 16 real quick. Starting 4. Genesis 16. We're going to start on the fourth verse. Third. Genesis chapter 16, verse 3. Yeah. Matter of fact, I'm going to start on 3 and I'll tell you to pick up. It says, And Sarai Abram's wife took Hagar and made the Egyptian. After Abram had dwelt and lived 10 years in the land of Canaan, or Canaan, and gave her to her husband, Abram, to be his wife. So he did some church for him and that that was his wife, Abram. It says that he went in unto Hagar, and she conceived. You know, when she saw that he conceived, that she had conceived her mistress. Mistress of the new way, 
You know how like my brother Gabriel, one way how to say it is uh, like Gabriel or Gabriel It means a mighty the head. In this context, it's the lady, the queen, the mission. Mission is not a secret woman. It's a head woman. All right. So um, it goes on to say, uh, our mission was despised in our eyes. And so Ryan said unto the Abel, my rock will be upon you. I've given my maid into thy bosom. And when she saw that she had conceived, I, Sarah, was despised in Hagar's eyes, her eyes. But then she said to her husband, the Lord judge between me and you. Like, let the Lord decide, the Lord decide between me and you. So she wanted to put it up on Abraham. But Abraham said unto Sarah, Behold, your man is in your hands. Like, why are you putting it on me? This is your hands. Do it to her as it pleased with you. And look at this. And Sarai dealt what? Harley with her. She dealt Harley with her. And it says, And she fled from her face. So here it is. She ended up dealing Harley with her. In this verse, it's the Hebrew word. Um, that's Aneha, and that's dealing with the word hardly. In your Bible, it's H A R D L Y. She dealt hardly with her. The Hebrew word there is the same word Ana, and guess what? That is the same word for afflicting. Dealt hardly with. It's the same Hebrew word. Abase, self afflict, chastity. So just as Sarah dealt hardly with Hagar, that's what you ought to be doing to yourself. That's not a happy time. You're happy. You obviously not being hard on yourself. Not hard enough. So she dealt hardly with her. Yeah. Uh, she did with now let's go to uh, Exodus 10 right quick and look at the third of verse. I think it's Exodus 10. Exodus 10, chapter 10, verse 3. Yeah, let's see that. And Moses and Aaron came into unto Pharaoh and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord God of the Hebrews. God of the Lord. Of the Hebrews. Come on. How long would thou refuse to humble thyself before me? Let my people go, that they may serve me. So the question was, how, what, how, so they were how? How long will thou refuse to humble thyself before me? Well, look, we can even say that to you all tonight. How long will you refuse to humble yourself before the Father? We can even say that. If you in this day and you're not humbling yourself before God, you can be just like Pharaoh. Don't have a spirit of favor on you. You can be just like him. Part of your heart so that you don't humble yourself, that you don't afflict yourself, that you don't want to forgive, that you don't want to pardon of others. Because if you don't, the Lord won't forgive you. And you'll be put to death. You understand that? So, Guess what word is that then? Let my notes. Let's see right here. Is that the same Hebrew word? Anam. Same thing. To be humble, press, downcast, humble, and sit down. Read that verse one more time. This is Exodus chapter 10 and verse 3. What's that? And Moses and Aaron came in unto Pharaoh and said unto him, Thus said the Lord God of the Hebrews. How long would thou refuse to humble thyself before me? Let my people go that they may serve me. So, this can also be looked at as crying out or singing. The same word, Exodus chapter 32 and 18. Right on. Exodus 32, I'll look at the 18th verse. Exodus chapter 32, verse 18. Let's get it. So you see um, the word humble, right? I'm going to show, especially when you all go back to the video. The viewers can see this first. 
We're going to look at the word for uh, yep. Let me see if I can remember. Ain't called a notes. Oh, there is that. Um, the ain't called a notes. Kabusha called a notes. I know he some uh, show mirror. So now we see it is for shouts. Then we also see it for we also see it for singing. So we mentioned three times in this chapter for crying, for singing, and for shouting. So go ahead and read it in English real quick. All right. Exodus chapter 32, verse 18. And he said, Is it not the voice of them that shout? Is not the voice of them that what? That shout? Here it is right here. Look. For shout. See that, guys? Shout. What else? For mastery. Mm -hmm. Neither is it the voice of them that cry. So, notice that for mastery is the same word in general. Remember, we learned for the word uh, mistress, right? That's the same word, mastery. And I'm going to talk about giving right the head of the house. It's like the mass of the house, or like another word for mass, so strong, mighty, warrior, if you will. So, um, the word for cry, you say cry, right? Mm -hmm. Same thing you worry, I see that then. For cry. And what else? For being overcome, but the noise but of the, what? but the noise of them that sing. The noise of them that what? Sing. That's the same word of the noise of them that sing one. Do I hear it? See that? The same thing. So you see this guy? It also means to answer, to respond, to testify, to speak out, to make answer, to receive answer, to sing out. Pay attention. Look at that, guys. You see the jewels of flicks. Same thing. Bring low. So you're also singing out. You're crying out for the Lord. You're paying attention. You want to be heard? You want to be forgiven? Proudly for the Lord. So one time, let's start to It And he said, is it not the voice of them that shout for mastery? Neither is it, it, neither is it the voice of them that cry for being overcome. But the noise of them that sing do I hear. The noise of them that sing do I hear. So Leviticus 23 and 27 here. Leviticus 23 and 27 verse again. Leviticus. Leviticus chapter 23 verse 27. Hmm. Also on the 10th day of the 7th month there shall be a day of atonement. It shall be a holy convocation unto you. And you shall afflict your souls. All you shall afflict your souls. Remember, it's the same Hebrew word, guys. You come low to be afflicted, to be the friend of not happy, the friend of downcast, to humble himself, bow down, be afflicted, be humble, humiliated, and kind of afflicted. This is you beating yourself down. A self check. Is better than a patient. Listen, it's not for me to tell you your problems. You know. Uh, sort of your mind. You know what you did. You know what you said. You know what you thought you got away with it. You understand that? You know these things. You know. So you want to be humble or afflict your souls. Now earlier, let's go to Second Samuel chapter seven real quick. Earlier, I talked about prayer. If you were for prayer, it's um uh, in Second Samuel seven um to Balaam and has the rule of Balaam. So Second Samuel seven twenty four. Let's grab it real quick. There's a book in Second Samuel. Chapter 7, verse 24. We're going to read 24 and 27. For thou hast confirmed to thyself thy people Israel to be a people unto thee forever. 
and thou, Lord, art became, become their God. And now, O Lord God, the word that thou hast spoken concerning thy servant and concerning his house, establish it forever and do as thou hast said. And let thy name be magnified forever, saying, The Lord of hosts is the God over Israel. And let the house of thy servant David be established before thee. For thou, O Lord of hosts, here we go, verse 27, for thou, O Lord of hosts, God of Israel, have revealed to thy servant, saying, I will build thee a house. Therefore have thy servant found in his heart to pray this prayer unto thee. So pray this prayer unto me. Let's see here. Lahit Halel. This is the word of prayer. And it says, the prayer has the word of Allah. And brother, can you do me a favor? Can you read what that says now? To intervene. Interpose, pray. Now, this is from the word pray in uh, verse 27. So let's read that again. Was it that? Or yeah, uh, okay. Okay. To intervene, interpose, pray, to meditate, judge, to well, that, judge. Judge. Man, I did not tell y'all that a uh, self check is better than a paycheck. In other words, to afflict yourselves and judge yourselves. That scripture say uh, if we judge ourselves first. Yes, uh, we're gonna matter of fact, we're gonna grab that next. Thing. Yeah, come on, we're talking about examining ourselves, break, huh? About examining ourselves, yeah, yeah, okay, we'll grab that next. So, to intercede, to pray, to intercede, to pray. So, look, when you are confessing your, uh, your sins and when you're judging your souls, confessing your sins, the greatest afflicted is to confront your own deeds. Y'all hear what I'm saying? To confront your own deeds. To acknowledge your own wrongdoings. You know what you did, bro. That first Corinthians. Better than anybody in verse 11. Yeah, that's what we're going to go next. So we should be seeing our forgiveness for people who have done wrong to us and those who have wrong. If you don't, then there's no point of a tone. There's no point in this. There's no point in this. So, First Corinthians eleven. That's right. First Corinthians chapter uh, eleven, verse thirty. I'm gonna need this. Thirty-one. Twenty-eight. Oh, twenty-eight. Twenty-eight. First Corinthians chapter eleven, verse twenty-eight. Come on. But let a man examine himself. The Bible says, "Let every man woman." Examine himself. examine himself. And so yeah, let, we read this all the time in the bathroom, right? Let every man examine himself. Go ahead. And so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. Come on. For if he eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself. If he condemn himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Uh, the same for you guys. How my brother to start back. Oh, go ahead. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. Come on. Verse 31. For if we would judge ourselves. We would judge ourselves. You still should have this type of mindset, because that's what I'm talking about. If you judge yourselves. We should. How, do, how do you do this? Because you know what the law says. You know what the will of God is. And you view it if you listen. Or here, if you have a husband, you know what your husband requires. So anytime you go against these things or shoot them, you know what your parents require. You understand that? So read that again. For if we judge ourselves, we should not be judged. So in other words, if you judge yourself, examine yourself, ain't nobody else going to say, oh, well, you didn't do this, you didn't do that. Why? Because you already got on yourself. You already got on yourself. That's what atonement is about. Forgiveness. Speaking of atonement, this night was one of the greatest years that marked the greatest time when you can be forgiven for all of your sins. Those of us, of course, who confess Christ, we know that we have an advocate now who became the sacrifice for us. 
we'll go to the last part of the lesson. Understanding and remembering who is the atonement and why is the atonement. Let's go to Hebrews 10 real quick. Hebrews 10. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, verse 1. Verse 1. Mm -hmm. For the law having a shadow of good things to come. So the Bible says for the law having a shadow of good things to come. Now, for you Christians that might be watching this, most of you would see the word law and automatically assume the whole Old Testament, is what you would say. They have been taking the Apostle Paul's letters out of context. Paul, when, when, when you see the word law in what we call the New Testament, when we talk to Paul, etc., most cases that's talking about the sacrificial law, the law of atonement, the law that was up under the old priesthood, the Levitical priesthood, the order of Aaron. So it says the law having a shadow. A shadow is a representation of something. It's something that represents the very image, but not the actual image. Which actually talks about in this verse. Matter of fact, read that again. For the law having a shadow of good things to come. Right. And not the very image of the things. Come on. Can never with those sacrifices. With what? Can never with those sacrifices. Now we know with the law, this law is associated with sacrifice. And never with those sacrifices, which, who? which they offered year by year, which they, which the children of Israel, they offered a sacrifice when year by year, right? Continually make the comers thereunto perfect. So you see that? That's why we're not out there sacrificing animals right now, because the sacrifices that they were doing year by year could make perfect. In other words. So every year doing atonement, which is the time that we're in now, before Christ came, there was sacrifice. And that couldn't continue to make the comfort. But when coming in, it couldn't make them perfect. But let's continue, though, because something does. Verse 2. Make you perfect and bring perfection. Come on. For then would they not have ceased to be offered, uh -huh. because that the worshippers once heard. The worshippers once heard. Remember we learned about atonement it means heard the will cleansed. Come on. Should have had no more conscience of sin. So you see that? That's how you know that the animal sacrifice. That was just a shadow of things to come. Why did they still have conscience of their sins? Come on. But in those sacrifices, again, that's the law that he's talking about. But in those sacrifices, the law of atonement, what does it say? There is a remembrance of what? Remembrance. When you remember something, you reflect on something. There is a remember what? Again, made of sins every year. Every year, the one in time of atonement, you still remember your sins and your crimes. What makes you happy about that? What makes you happy that you went against your Lord? What did that make you happy? Nothing. This is not a happy time. Continue. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. That's the key word. Take away sins. That means back then you could have just stolen something and said, Well, here you go, uh, uh, the sons of Aaron. I'm going to just give you a turtle dove. I'm good now. You get what I'm saying? Look at that loophole. You get what I'm saying? Oh, I'm going to just go and do this over here. And then I already got my turtle dove. It was already ready. Let me go give you some bulls and goats because I'm about to go do wrong to somebody. So I got these four or five bulls over here, four or five goats. Okay, boom. I got room to go in and make some mistakes. Ready to see it. So the act of taking of the act of sacrificing during the time of atonement every year so that you can be forgiven for your sins for the entire year that were past. The blood of bulls and goats weren't doing nothing, just animals dying. That's why I said in the first chapter, you're like, look, in other words, 
just acknowledge your faults. Because these sacrifices don't mean nothing to me. Come on. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, right. he saith, Sacrifice and offerings thou wouldest not. He didn't want that. He didn't wish for that. Go ahead. But a body, but a, has, but a body, a body, body come on, has thou prepared me. That's Psalm 46 to way. When we read it, come on. And burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast had no pleasure. So the Lord did not have pleasure in sacrifice, the sacrificial law. He had no pleasure in that. Why? Because it, it, it didn't make him perfect. It didn't make the common known too perfect at all. The worship it didn't make you perfect. Animals were just dying and you were just willfully sin. That means nothing. Come on. Then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do thy will, O God. Above when he said sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offerings for sin. Oh, that was Offerings for sin. Come on. Thou wouldest not, right. neither has pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. What law? The sacrificial law. The atonement law. Think about that. Oh, it says a book form. You're going to come right back here. Go to Leviticus chapter 4, and let's read verse 20 real quick. Leviticus chapter 4, verse 20. Hold on one second. Leviticus 4, 20. Y'all really can say what y'all at. Y'all just said that he was here. Leviticus 1, 20, what is that? About um, the priests, the Levites. And, no. and he shall do... Hey, get it together, okay? All right, go ahead. And he shall do with the bullock as he did with the bullock for a sin offering. So you see what it is? Remember, the blood of bulls and goats couldn't take away sin. This is a bullock, a bull. And he said, this is some of the priests, the son of Aaron. He should do with this bull as he did with the bull for a what offering? A sin offering. Sin is the breaking of the law. So when a law was broken, you had an offering or a sacrifice. So this is a sin sacrifice. So you broke the law of God. You can bring the bull to the priest. Come on. So shall he do with this. Right. And the priest and the, the priest and the priest shall what shall make an atonement shall for make an atonement. Ain't that the time we're here now? The priest could make or should or shall make an atonement, meaning a sacrifice, reconciliation, because it reconciles you or brought you back to God. So the priest shall make an atonement for them, but the one that sinned. Go ahead. And it shall be forgiven them. It was so that you can be forgiven. These were the works of the law or the deeds of the law that the apostles were trying to snap off for you Christians. When you look at Galatians 2, 16 on down to 21, Romans 10 and 4, like how the works of the law on Christ was the end of the law. When you look at Galatians, I mean Romans 3, verse 20 on down to 31, you know about the, uh, the deeds of the law that you're not justified. When you look at Acts 13, 38 and 39, the things in the law of Moses in which you couldn't be justified by. That's what he's talking about, long story short. The atonement. Christ is the atonement now. That don't free you to start breaking God's law. That don't free you from not keeping tonight atonement. That don't free you from that at all. And if you Christians are watching this and you get convicted in your spirit, just do a talk of the night. May the Lord judge you of your intents. Because it's still a rehearsal. It's still a rehearsal. Uh -huh. It's still a rehearsal. That's why I don't get caught up in all the child doing the Thursday. Look, the Lord's going to judge off the intents of your heart. You in the season. But if you know what to be that day, you don't. That's where the crime comes in at. You get what I'm saying? But make no mistake about it. We as the nation of Israel, we've all tried the best of our ability. We should. And look, we all may got these days wrong. We all may got them wrong. But the Lord's going to try the reins. He's going to switch the heart. We read that in Jeremiah 17 and 10. So you will be judged off your intent. So, that being said, we see that the priests could sacrifice an animal and you would be forgiven for your sins. Grab Leviticus 17. I mean Leviticus 16, 16. This is the book of Leviticus, chapter 16. 
verse 16. And he shall make an atonement for the holy place. You see that? He shall make an atonement by sacrifice for the holy place. What else? Because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel. Right. And because of their transgressions right. and all their sins. So you see that? That was a law that was put in place. In case you see it. Which is the transgression of the law. The breaking of the law. The law that was added for transgression was atonement, animal sacrifice. That was put in place so that you can be forgiven, and Christ is the atonement. So let's go back to, uh, matter of fact, let's go to Leviticus 17, 11, real quick. Leviticus 17, verse 11. The book of Leviticus, chapter 17, verse 11. Come on, wait. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. The life of the flesh is in what? The blood. In the blood. And we justified by the blood of Christ. And Christ is the one who gives life. Don't he tell us in John 14 and 6, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No man can come to the Father but by me. Well, we can't do that unless we justify by the blood. And the blood before Christ came that gave us life, that gave us forgiveness. What did it say again? For the life of the flesh is in the blood. In the what? Blood. Come on. And I have given it to you. I. That's what the Lord said. I, the, the Lord and the Lord have given it to you. Where? Upon the altar. The what? Upon the altar. Now, Christians, all this meet me at the altar. What is that? That's a place of sacrifice. Come on down to the altar. That's the place of sacrifice. Come on. To make an atonement for your soul. To make an atonement for your souls. Yourselves. What else? For it is the blood. It is the blood. The blood. Right. That make it an atonement for the soul. That still didn't change to the day. It is the blood that make an atonement for you. And what blood? Makes our own. Whose blood? The Messiah, the Christ. Jump down to 14. Verse 14. For it is the life of all flesh. The blood of it is for the life thereof. Mm -hmm. Therefore, I said unto the chosen of Israel, Ye shall eat the blood of no manner of flesh. For the life of all flesh is the blood thereof. Whosoever eateth it shall be cut off. So let's go back to Hebrews 10. That, uh, Leviticus 17. Leviticus 17, yeah. Leviticus 17, 11. And Leviticus 17, 14. My brother, I'm saying that. So I ain't saying that. Go ahead and read it. Let me know what you So it says in Hebrews 10, uh, and verse 9, it said, Are you ready? Okay. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 9. Whoa. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first that he may establish the second. The Lord took away the first that he may establish the second. What do you think he's talking about? The covenant. But what covenant, what in the covenant is he talking about? Hebrews 7 tells us these things. There was something in the law that was had affirmed the weakness of sin, and that was the animal sacrifice. So he taketh away the first that he may establish or introduce or bring in the second. When you establish something, I mean, you bring it in. Oh, this is the book of my right? Romans 3 and 31, real quick. For you Christians that might be celebrating over there, the old he, like, that's the old company. I mean, that new company now. If you see that word established, especially you like the word established, what does it say in Romans chapter 3? And we're going to look at verse 31 with the last verse. What does it say? Romans 3 and 31. Chapter 3, verse 31. Come on. Do we then make void the law? Do we faith? then make void or get rid of the law? What do you say? Through faith? Just because we got faith now with Christ? God, God forbid. No. Yea, we establish the law. The same law says we're going to establish. We're going to bring in this law. That's the that's, that's new text for the Christians. Let's go back now. Hebrews 10. Hebrews chapter 10. We got 11. 10. 10. 10 and 10. By the which will we are sanctified. We are sanctified, meaning cleansed, set apart, whatever. 
through the offering, through the offering of the sacrifice of the body of Yahweh Shah Mashiach. Or Jesus the Christ, or Yeshua Mashiach, or Yahushua Mashiach. Once for all. So we don't have to sacrifice for sins anymore. We don't have to sacrifice for sins anymore. As a matter of fact, jump down to 18 real quick. Verse 18. What is that? Now where remission of these is. Remission means forgiveness. While we're remission of these is. There is no more offering for sin. There is no more offering or a sacrifice when you break the law of God anymore. Now, what happens if you know the law and you totally disregard the law of God? Because remember, we're talking about sacrifice. Jump down to verse 26. 26. Mm -hmm. For if we sin willfully. This is the judgment for Christ. If we sin willfully, if we break the law of God willfully. Come on. After that, we have received the knowledge of the truth. You know better. You receive the knowledge. That's the truth. You deliberately break it. What does it say? There remaineth no more sacrifices for sin. You see that? Blood had to be shed so that you can be forgiven. Animals had to die so that you can be forgiven. We just read the Leviticus 4 point. We just read that Christ is the sacrifice now. He's the one that died for our sin. He's the sacrifice for our sins. He took the place of the animals so that you can be forgiven for your sins. If you sin woefully after you have received the knowledge of the truth, there ain't no more sacrifice for sins. That means there isn't no forgiveness for you. You cannot break the law of God on purpose at all. No forgiveness, no atonement for that. There's no atonement for that. Let's go, let's go back to Romans 3 now and think about it. Let's go back to Romans 3. Romans 3 and 20. The book of Romans, chapter 3, verse 20. Come on, where is it? Therefore, by the deeds of the law. They were the deeds of the law. Deeds mean the works. Because Galatians 2 and 16 speaks of the same thing. Let me make sure. That Galatians 3, I mean, uh, 2 and 16, let me make sure. Y'all still where y'all at? Uh, I'm a Genesis truth. Yeah, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law. Absolutely. The same sort of thing. So, um, Romans 3 and uh, this one, boy. therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. You see that? So, Chris, don't celebrate because the verse before, the chapter before that, Romans 2 and 13 says what? Romans 2 and 13, Listen. it says, For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. One more time. For not the hearers of the law are just before God. So, not the hearers of the law are justified innocent. Uh, declared righteous, clear from all guilt. So not not just because you hear the law, you think if you hear the law, you're justified. No. But what? But the doers of the law shall be justified. So in order for you to be justified, you have to do what? The law. So let's go back to Romans three twenty because the passage of reading it said we not justified by the law, Verse and they don't 20. understand what they're reading. Call verse twenty. Therefore, by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight. Paul did not clear up so you can just break his law. In other words, in language terms, he's saying by animal sacrifice, you're not going to be innocent, forgiven in the sight of God. Then it says, for what? For by the law, for, the law, for by the law. That's how you know the law still stands. Because Paul said by the what? By the law. Is the knowledge of sin. Wait a minute. Let me make sure I heard this right. But by the law is the what? The knowledge. The knowledge of sin. The knowledge of sin. Because sin, according to 1 John chapter 3, verse 4, it tells us, for whosoever committed sin transgresses also the law. But sin is the transgression of the law. Sin is the transgression of the law. 
So all it's saying about the law is the knowledge of sin. It tells us that Romans 4, uh, Romans 4 and 15, bread of matter of fact, Romans 4 and 15, real quick. There's a book of Romans, chapter 4, verse 15. What does it say? Because the law worketh wrath. Because the law worketh wrath. For where no law is, there is no transgression. If there ain't no law, ain't no sin. But we know the law still stands because sin still exists. Sin is still in the world. And for the law still stands. Uh -huh. Romans 5 and 13 says what? Romans 5 and 13 says, For until the law, sin was in the world. But well, until the law, sin was in the world. But what? But sin is not imputed. Sin is not imputed. Meaning it's not counted. It's not reckoned. When what? When there is no law. When the law is not counted as a sin. Because sin is the transgression of the law. Romans 7 and 7. The book of Romans, chapter 7, verse 7. What did he say right here? He said, What shall we say then? Right. Is the law sin? Is the law of God is that sin? What did he say? God forbid. No. Nay, I had not known sin. Look at what he said. I didn't even know what sin was, in other words. But by the law. Unless the, unless I knew the law, in other words. Go ahead. For I had not known lust. I had not known what lust was, in other words. Except the law had except said. What? Except the law. Except the law had said. What? Thou shalt not covet. That's Exodus chapter 20, verse 17. I had not known. In other words, I ain't know who the command was unless I knew the law. Matter of fact, Romans 8, real quick. Romans 8. Romans 8 and verse 6. Verse 6. Come on. For to be carnally minded is death. Right. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. If you're walking after the law of sin, your sinful nature, your carnal mind, the Bible says it's death. But to be spiritually minded when you're walking in Christ, that's life and peace. Come on. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. That's enmity with God. Separation with God. Well, let's find out why. Because if you carnally minded in your flesh, still not forgiving. For it is not subject to the law of God. Look at that. But the church say, we don't have to keep the law of God anymore. Neither indeed can be. Neither indeed can be. Now let's go back to that chapter three real quick. And it's just a long story, but I got lessons on this. If anybody want, want me to send them lessons to the viewers out there, just reach out. I'll send you the lessons doing the law of grace. Uh, going over in these scriptures where the church says we don't have to keep the law of God anymore. Let's go to Hebrew 2 and read that eight and read about we saved by grace and whatnot. You know how they like to do that, but they'll keep reading down and then. Oh, what about this? Uh, the uh, it was enmity when they try to go to Colossians two, and sixteen, or fourteen, dealing with uh, uh, how he's nailed to the cross. You know, so look, church, we know every scripture you try to do, try to get out of keeping the commandments of God. So let's go back to Romans three, real quick, and we're going to jump down to twenty two. Let's jump down to twenty two. It's the book of Romans, chapter 3, verse 22. Come on. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith. Which is by who? By faith. Not by the Levitical priests sitting there. By the high priests of the order of the of their Christ, which we learn in Hebrews 6 and 20. Come on. By faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe. That's the key word. Got to believe. Got to have faith. Come on. For there is no difference. Right. For all have sinned. So that we're sinned. S I N N E D. Is that past, present, or future? Past. That means at one point you mess up. That's what he's saying. That at one point we all mess up. Come on. And come short of the glory of God. Come on. Be, being justified freely being by what? justified freely. Being justified for free. Mean without cost. Come on. By his grace. Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Through his grace. That is through the redemption of the salvation that is in Christ Jesus. Notice it's not a period like that. That is in Christ Jesus whom God has what? Redeemed. Verse 24. 25. Whom God has God have set forth to be a propitiation. Oh, no. He brought him on this earth to be a propitiation. What is that? Let's see what that is. Set this up. So here it is, an atoning fix. Mm. Specifically, the lid of the ark in the temple, mercy seat, propitiation. 
God sent him forth to be the sacrifice, the atoning bit. But notice it said specifically the lid of the ark in the temple. This is where the Levites, the son of the Aaron, were doing their sacrifices in the temple. Hold it to the bookmark, Leviticus 16. Let's go back there right quick. Leviticus 16. Leviticus 16. This is dealing with the law of atonement. See, you church folks, you got to understand the Torah, the law first, before you can read Paul's letters. Because he was speaking to people that knew the law, Romans 7 and 1. So he wasn't speaking to beginners. These people knew and understood the Torah. So what you're reading in the so-called New Testament, these things were taught in Torah. So Romans, I'm going to start Leviticus 16, because we're talking about a Torah. Reconciliation. Propitiation. Sacrifice. Atonement. Read verse 1. Leviticus chapter 16, verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron. When they offered, when they what? When they offered, when they offered, that means what, guys? When they sacrifice, they gave an offering. Right? Come on, wait. before the Lord and died, and what? And died. So here it is. They end up making an offering, and they still end up dying. Let's find out why. Come on. And the Lord said unto Moses. Now he's going to give a command to Moses. What he said. Speak unto Aaron thy brother. That he what? That he come not at all times into the holy place. Into the holy place. What else? Within the veil. Within or behind the veil. Remember in Matthew 27 verse 46 and 51. When Christ died. The veil of the temple. Ripped. This is the same temple where the priests. Sacrifice animals. That was the ending of the Levitical priesthood. When I say Levitical, Levi, but you knew it's up there. The son of Aaron. Here it is the veil. They couldn't go within that veil in what? Before the what? Mercy seat. Before being in the presence of that mercy seat. But they could not go. Look at what it says right here. You have when you see the word mercy seat, y'all, and y'all aim this Bible. Guess what I see? I see how can promote. And let's see what is that? How can promote? So it says mercy seat, place of atonement. Mm. That's what that means right there. It says a golden plate of propitiation. That's what we're reading Romans 3. He was a propitiation. Matter of fact, read Romans 3 and 24 again. Romans chapter 3, verse 24. What is it? Being justified by okay, yeah. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. Come on. Whom God have set forth to be a propitiation. Propitiation. Look at this right here, y'all. Look on the screen. It says a golden plate of propitiation. On which the high priest sprinkled at least seven times on the day of atonement, symbolically reconciling or bringing back Jehovah and his chosen people, the Israelites. Coming on down, it means a lid used on the cover of the sacred ark, mercy. It comes from the same word, Kippur. Remember earlier, we deal with Yom Kippur, right? All these have the same root word, the same meaning. So this is what most church folks don't understand. They don't fully understand. Then Paul was talking about a sacrificial law. Uh -huh. Not freeing you up to just break God's law and say you can eat what you want to eat and try to use Acts 10, uh, 12 and 15, and you don't read down to 28 about Peter's vision. No. So when you look at what these words mean, it says to cover, to purge, make a tome, reconciliation, cover over the pitch, to cover, to pacify, propitiate, to cover, atone for sin, make a tome for. All these things that we went over earlier, remember this? What did I say right there, Otto? 
Forgive. So when they sacrificed, it was so that you can be forgiven. Be merciful, pacify, pardon, purge. Purge away, purge off, make reconciliation. So let's read that Leviticus 16 again. Leviticus chapter 16, verse 1. Um, verse 2 again. Verse 2. And the Lord said unto Moses, Speak unto Aaron thy brother, that he come not at all times into the holy place within the veil before the mercy seat, which is upon the ark, that he die not. So they couldn't come in that spot there, the veil which is in the presence of the mercy seat. Said they was going to die. But look at what God said. Well, technically, Christ is another topic, though. What did he say? What's the first two words out there? For I. For I. This is the Lord. I will what? Will appear in the cloud upon the mercy seat. So who was on the mercy seat, John? Christ. This was a shadow of things to come. Mm. This was a shadow, or Christ was a shadow of things to come. So when you preach it all the time, I'm that thou was a schoolmaster. And they try to read Galatians 3, 24 and down. It's like, oh, back it up to verse 19. Look at that. But let's continue, though. So here it is. They understood the Lord came down. The Lord had mercy. Come on, verse 3. Thus shall Aaron come into the holy place. With a young bullet for a sin offering. For what kind of offering? For a sin offering. You break the law. A sin offering. Come on. And a ram for a burnt offering. One more verse four. He shall put on the holy linen coat. So, so here it is. This is only under the Levitical priesthood. So you count to try to use Leviticus 16 and four, which are breaches doctrine. This was under the Levitical priesthood, by the way. Come on. He shall put on the holy linen coat. And he shall have the linen breeches the upon linen breeches upon his flesh. He should have the linen breeches. This right here. Umi, I'm sorry, Umi Nisse. By Ignaz. What was that? Drops. Underwear. That's what this is for. To cover the nakedness. To store up. To save. That's what it was. So the Levitical priest, the son of Aaron, had breached it. This was a part of their garments so they officiated in the temple. Come on. And shall be girded with a linen girdle, and with the linen attire, Mitri, excuse me, mm -hmm. shall be, uh, shall he be attired. These are the holy garments. Right. Therefore shall he wash his flesh in water, and so put them on. Now let's go back to Romans 3. Romans 3. And now we're in... 25. But, I'm going to read this real quick. Okay. Uh, I'm going to read 24 and 25. Being justified, cleared of all guilt, for free, meaning without cost, by his grace through the redemption or the salvation that is in Christ Jesus, or Yeshua HaMashiach, or Yahushua HaMashiach, or some of us say Yahushua HaMashiach, or what the Christians say in the cross. Was that whom God has set forth to be, to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, not animal's blood, but in his blood. But look at this though, to declare his righteousness for the remission or the forgiveness of sins that are past. That's why he said in verse 23, for all have seen as past sins. Then it says through the forbearance of God. Now remember when we're dealing with the mercy seat. Propitiation, atonement, reconciliation. Raise your hand if you remember that word coming out. Reconciliation. We had just saw it, right? And that was associated with atonement, sacrifice. What reconciled us back to God before Christ came? Because if you understand this, you will understand what Paul is talking about. Here. That's what Second Chronicles chapter twenty-nine. Uh, Second okay. Chronicles 29, and I'm going to start 21. It says, And they brought seven bullocks. Now remember, we're in Leviticus 4 and 20 about the bullocks of the priests doing this uh, sin, obviously, you can be forgiven, right? 
So it says that they brought seven bull oxen, seven rams, seven lambs, seven male goats for a sin offering, for a sin sacrifice, atonement. For the kingdom and for the sanctuary and for Judah. And he commanded the priests, specifically to the sons of Aaron, to sacrifice on the altar of the Lord. So they killed the bullocks, and the priests received the blood. Now remember Leviticus 17 11, Leviticus 17 14, even in Genesis uh, 9 and 4, blood represents the life. And we know Christ is down the line, we judge the Bible by the blood of Christ. But you gotta believe, you gotta have that faith. So it says, and sprinkled on the altar likewise. And they had killed seven rams. They sprinkled on the blood upon the altar. They killed also a lamb, and they sprinkled the blood upon the altar. And here we go. And they brought forth the he goats, a male goats, for the sin offering before the king and the congregation, and they laid their hands on them. Verse 24, and the priests killed them. They had to die. The animals had to be put to death. But look at this. When they did this, it says, and they made reconciliation with their blood. Who remember the word reconciliation? That's the same word for reconcile. It brought them back to God. Animals had to die. Innocent animals had to die so they needed to forget the sin. But remember, the Hebrew sin, it, it, the blood of the ghost could not take away sins at all. So it says, and they made reconciliation with their blood. Whose blood? These animals that died. Then it says, upon the altar to make an atonement for all Israel. Notice it said, these things were done to make an atonement. The competitor in Hebrew said the same work in Paul. But you know it's poor. Look at it. It's covered. Confer has been torn. Look at that. Make reconciliation. See that? Coming on down to disannul. Mean to get rid of your hearts. Forgive. Be passive. Mercy to pardon to purge. So just like we in atonement. Same thing for others so that your crimes can be forgiven. You understand that? Think about it. We have to sacrifice animals today and look at how sin has increased in this world. Man, probably wouldn't be no animals in the world today. Come on, man. Like we see that when they run out of uh, meat in some places. Imagine that, and then you're doing this with your sins. Jeez. Like, come on. Everybody needs meat. Man, you see what I'm saying? <laughs> Let's go back to that Romans real quick. Romans 3. Romans chapter 3. 25. Verse 25. Whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation. There it is again. A propitiation. Let's click on that word propitiation one more time. Because now we got a better idea of what that means. Oh, yeah. So here we go. It says, an atonement bit, specifically the lid of the ark in the temple, mercy seat, propitiation. So obviously, when Paul was writing his letter, they knew and understood that. You don't have to go in the temple to sacrifice animals anymore. The person who y'all are rejecting is the person that took the place of that. Christians don't understand that and think that, oh, it was all that's done away with. They would have known and understood that Christ is the sacrifice. So when they say, oh, the law done away with, what law are we talking about? The atonement. Things that the Levitical priests had to do that justifies. That is the law that we are no longer under it. So the same person to turn around and read Romans 6 to 23, which says the way you see death. Uh, that means when you break God's law, you what? You die. But the Bible says without no law, there's no sin. So that means there will be no point of forgiveness, no point of when they go get baptized. It's like, well, why are you getting baptized? But watch the way you want. You'll see, right? What well, sin is the transgression of the law. You're cleansing the blood of Christ now. 
They know this, but they don't fully connect all of the dots. So this is dealing with a sacrifice. What Paul is talking about. It's a long story short. So let's jump down to verse 28. Verse 28. Therefore, we conclude, we conclude meaning in conclusion, go ahead. that a man is justified by faith. A man is justified by what? Faith. No, no. Without the deeds of the law. So a man is justified by belief. By the belief in Christ. Without the deeds of the law, which is the animal sacrifice. Now hit that verse 31 again. Do we then make void the law through faith? But remember, we just read that a man is justified by faith. He's innocent by faith. What is that? God forbid. No. Yea, we establish the law. We're going to establish the law. It seems the NIV verse is saying this. It says, do we then uh, know it by the law, by this faith? Not at all. Rather, we uphold the law. Do the ESV verse is saying. Do we then overthrow the law by this faith? By no means. On the contrary, we uphold the law. That is a total contradiction in what we hear in the Christian church today. Let's see the NET, the New English translation. Will we then nullify the law through faith? Absolutely not. Instead, we uphold the law. We uphold the law. One more time in the KJV, Romans 10 31. Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid. God forbid, many by no means we don't do that. Okay. Yeah, we established the law. Yeah, we established the law. Let's look at uh we get a few more. First John chapter two. Who does appreciate that? Mm -hmm. Man, hallelujah. <laughs> first John chapter two, verse one and two. Let's see. Book of first John chapter two, verse one. Come on. My little children, these things write I unto you that ye sin not. The Bible says that you sin not, and you don't break God's law. Remember, first John three and four says. Whosoever commits sin, like whoever does it, transgress also the law. When the church say it ain't no more law, then that means ain't no more sin. Like we read in Romans 5 and 13, Romans 4 and 15. But the Bible says, but sin is the transgression of the law. But sin is the transgression of the law. So now go ahead and read that again. Verse 1. My little children. These things write I unto you that ye sin not. Don't break our law. Come on. And if any man sin, if any man break the law of God, we have an advocate for, with the Father, Jesus the Christ. So we have an advocate. Let's look on this word advocate real quick. So if any man breaks the law of God, they have an advocate. It says advocate, comfort. See that? Some called to one side, especially called to one's aid. To one's aid. Look at this, an intercessor. See that? It says, a Christ in his exaltation at God's right hand, pleading with God, the Father, for the pardon of our sins. You have an assistant, in other words. So if you break God's law, if you sin, you have somebody to speak on your behalf so that you can be forgiven. And he already died for, you. for the sins that are past. It don't mean you keep sin. Because we read earlier, we sin deliberately after you receive the knowledge that you're the remain of all the sin. He sins one sin. So we have an advocate, which is Christ. And notice after the word um, righteous is not a period, right? And it's more. And what else it says about this advocate, Christ? That he's what? Je Jesus Christ, the righteous, and he is the propitiation. There it is again. He is the propitiation for what? For our sins. He is the propitiation for our sins. Remember, God, we just went to propitiation. Remember this story? Appeasing, propitiate. This means appeasing, propitiation. Look at this. Atonement. So he's the atonement. Remember, we're in atonement right now. He's the atonement. What else? And he is the propitiation for our sins. He's the atonement for our sins. Go ahead. And not for ours only. And not for the children of Israel only, but who? But also for the sins of the whole world. Did it say the word of Israel or what? 
the whole world, the whole world for the sins. So he is a propitiation for our sins and the sins of the entire world. Raise your hand if you understand that. I understand that. He is a propitiation for us all. The atonement, the sacrifice. Read that verse one more time. And he is the propitiation so for our sins. The he sacrificed, come on. For our sins, mm -hmm. and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Also for the sins of the entire world. But you do was out there. If you have not accepted Christ as your Savior, as your atonement, today is the day to do that, right now. Not tomorrow, but it's for you to repent right now. Right now, repent. But the time is at hand. I appreciate it, brother. Come on, man. what you got for me, y'all? I only got another script for this here. John 4 and 42. Let me grab it all off. We're going to St. John chapter 4, and he wants a 40 second verse. Go ahead. 41. 41. Come on. And many more believe because of his own word. Come on. And said unto the woman, Now we believe. So Stop. this is building with when Christ is at the uh, talking to the woman at the well. And here it is. And he says to the woman, Now what? Now we believe. Come on. Not because of thy saying. Not because of what you say. But what? But we have heard him ourselves. We have heard Christ ourselves. Come on. And know that this is indeed the Christ. You know that he is the Messiah. Come on. The Savior of the world. The Savior of who? The world. Now let's jump up to 24 real quick. Go ahead. God is a spirit. Come on. And they that worship him must worship him in the spirit and in truth. Come on. The woman said unto him, This is the same one. What you say? I I know the Messiah is coming. I know that the Messiah is coming. Come on. Which is called Christ. Called Christ. When he is come, right? He will tell us all things. She didn't know at the point when she said this, she was talking to him at the point, but she knew that the Messiah was coming. Come on. Jesus said unto her, What's that? I that speak unto thee am he. I that speak unto you am he. I am he. And upon this came his disciples Come on. and marveled that he talked with the woman. Yet no man said, What seekest thou? Or why talkest thou with her? The woman then left her water pot right. and went her way into the city and said to the man, What's Come, see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Come on. Is not this the Christ? Mm -hmm. You see that? It's not this the Messiah. So he's doing understood these things. So the verse that my brother gave. She was saying, well, I believe not because of what she told me, but because of what? Remember, verse 42 again. Because and it, we believe not because of thy sin, for we have heard him ourselves. We heard him ourselves. Come on. And know that this is indeed the Christ. This is indeed the Christ. So let's go to um 1 Corinthians real quick. And there's a point I want to go here because you have some people that say, well, we don't have to keep atonement because Christ is the atonement. So we have to atonement. And look, he is the atonement, but it doesn't free you from keeping the law of God. So there are some people that say, well, we don't have to keep it because he's already the atonement. But if that's the case, let's look at 1 Corinthians 5 real quick. 1 Corinthians 5 and 7. Dealing with a com uh, a feast that we commanded to keep. This is a book of First Corinthians, chapter five, verse seven. What is that? Purge out, therefore, the old leaven. What is that old leaven? That man who you come on. That ye may be a new lump. That she may be a new lump, a new creature. In other words, in Christ. Come on. As ye are unleavened. Because remember, Passover was known to the feast of unleavened bread, right? And we commanded to eat unleavened bread for seven days, right? Come on. For even Christ, even who? Even Christ. Oh, so Paul is acknowledging Christ here. Even Christ, our what? Our Passover. Is our Passover, meaning he's our lamb. He was our sacrifice. Even our atonement is what? It's sacrifice for us. So he recognized his sacrifice, right? That's no one saying about that. He recognized that. Look, we keep Passover, right? But he says, he 
was our sacrifice, right? But then it says what? Read this slow. It, verse 8. Therefore, let us let keep, what? Let us. Let what? Let us. Do what? Keep the feet. The Bible says what? Keep the feet. The Bible says what? Keep the feet. Let's flip on that real quick. Keep the feet. It says, keep a feast day, celebrate a feast, to observe a festival. Keep the feast. So remember, Christ right here was acknowledged as our Passover, right? So let's flip on this real quick. He was our Passover, right? Let's see what this says here. The Pentecost sacrifice was the custom to be offered for the people's deliverance of the old from Egypt. Look at this, the Pentecost, the Passover lamb, i.e. the lamb of the Israelites. See that? A custom to where a slay and eat or kill the 14th day of the month of Nisan, also known as the day of God. Um, but it's in the first month of their year. That's dealing with the, uh, Exodus 12, Exodus 13, Deuteronomy 16, 1, etc. But anyway, um, it says the Paschal feast, the feast of the Passover, extended from the 14th to the 20th day of the month of Nisan. And it was changed to Nisan after uh, Babylon. That's a little topic. But anyway, it says the Passover, the meal of the day, the festival or the special sacrifices connected with it. Easter Passover, and not Easter as in bunnies laying eggs. I got a video on my YouTube channel of me talking about that right here. So we will share this video right here. Yeah. If you look at this video, I'm talking about it. Um, I just made an obvious video. Here we go, how they saw it. But anyway, that being said, I have a video on this already. It's not Easter, but you think it all. So we're going to celebrate this room. I think you know what you're talking about. Bunnies don't lay eggs. No one did that custom or practice in the Bible. It is pagan, it is wicked, and it's evil, and it's against the Bible. Repent. If you got your kids going to Easter, they didn't do that. They didn't do that. So here it is. Read verse 7 again and 8. Verse 7. Purge out, therefore, the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump. As ye are unleavened, for even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. So Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed. He's killed for us. Come on. Therefore, let us keep the feet. Let us do what? Let us keep the feet. Let us ignore the feast. We don't got to keep it anymore. Let us what? Keep the feast. Right. Not with old leaven. Don't keep the feast with old leaven. Leaven or yeast rise up like sin. Pride. Arrogance, mm. unforgiveness. So don't keep it with that old leaven. Neither with what? Neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Don't be like Judas Iscariot coming to the feast of Passover, what they call the Lord's Supper, with malice and wickedness in your mind. But you should be observing and keeping the Passover feast. With the unleavened bread of sincerity and in truth. Sincerity and in truth. That's what a Matthew 3 says. Matthew 26, 17. Matthew chapter 26, verse 17. Kind of give an example of Christ was known as the Passover. Only the Passover. Because Leviticus 23, 1 through 6, you learn that you were supposed to be keeping the Passover in the first month. Uh, of their year. That's technically the month of the vision, of the fourth day and evening. Come on. Now, the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. The seven day feast is the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Look at that. Come on. The disciples came to Jesus. Look at that. For you Christians say, oh, uh, being a Christian means to be Christ like. Well, Christ kept Passover. Let's be Christ like to keep the feast here. Uh, Come on. Saying unto him, where will thou that we prepare for thee to eat the Passover? The what? The Passover. Come on, come on. And he said, Now, when did he say this? The first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. That's one of the feast days. All right. That's one of the feast days. I just want to point that out. Jump down to 26 real quick. Verse 26. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it 
And praises like to do this on communion every first Sunday, even though this is done every year at Passover. So when y'all go to Prince Richard's 11, as often as you do it, you're going to remember to be. Yeah, you do it often every year at Passover. But that's an uncommon. Watch my Passover. I'm going to learn about that. Y'all go and read. They like to go to Prince Richard's 11, 2, 3, 2, 6. And they only read in context. And I understand that Paul is talking in past tense about this night. Come on. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and break it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them saying, drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament. This is, the, this is my blood of the New Testament, meaning of the new contract of readings. Come on. Which is shed for many for the remission of sin. Notice it said Christ's blood was of a new covenant of the contract and was shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. Why is that? Hebrews 9, 18 to 22. It's the book of Hebrews, chapter 9, verse 18. For a testament is of force after men are dead. So you see that? When this testament comes in, it's like out of God. Otherwise, it is of no strength right. at all while the testament is alive. The blood got to be shed. Come on, wait a minute. Remember, before Christ, blood was shed. The blood of animals, blood has to be shed. Ah, come on. For when Moses, oh, excuse me, uh, whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated without blood. Come on, it's about to explain what he means with that. Come on. For when Moses has spoken every precept, he spoke every precept or every command, come on, to all the people according to the law, the law, the sacrifice, come on, he took the blood of he calves, took what? he took the blood of calves and, and of goats with, with water, right, and scarlet mm -hmm. wool and hyssop. Uh -huh. And sprinkled both the book and all the people. There was an agreement. Come on. Saying, This is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. This is basically what Christ just said. Same thing that Moses said, basically. Come on. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. Come on. Now check this out. This is the verse that I want, verse 22. Hey, very good to tell you because he just said. About the blood of the testament, which has been shed for many for the forgiveness of sins, right? Come on. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. Purged. Remember, we learned about that earlier. Atonement. One of the words I said was purged, which means cleanse. So read that one more time. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. Purged or cleansed with blood. Come on. And without shedding of blood, without the shedding of blood. Is no remission. There is no remission. There's no forgiveness. Two more. Let's go to Hebrews 7. Hebrews. Because I can do this all day. Y'all know me. Hebrews 7. And uh, let's hit 20, uh, 24 to 28. And then we're in with Galatians 3. Come on. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 24. But this man. Talking about Christ. Because he continueth ever right. have an unchangeable priesthood. So you read early in the chapter, you read about the Levitical priesthood. Then you have what's called the order of Melchizedek, where Christ is now the high priest, instead of those Levitical priests, where they have the sacrifice. There was a change in the law. And if you Christians want to understand that, just reach out to me. I'll get you, yo. Come on. Wherefore, he is able often to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him. He's the intercession. He's the mediator. As we read, reading of first Timothy 2 and 5. He is the one that's able to save. But they gotta come to God, but they gotta come through him. Like we read in John 14, verse 6. Any other way, you would thief and a robber. As we read in 1 John chapter 10, verse 1 through 27. Sorry, Muslims, repent. Come on. Seeing he ever liveth to make intercession. He is the intercession for them. He is the advocate, the go between. He needs to Come on. For such a high priest. So for such being this type of high priest became us. Now what does it say about the high priest? About Christ. Who is holy. So Christ is what? Holy. Whatever. Harmless. Whatever it is. Undefiled. This priest is what? 
holy, harmless, undefiled, undefiled, well to the priest, separate from sinners. We know that can't be no regular man, because whoever this priest is, he said he is separate from sinners. We read the first John one, and we say that we have not sinned. The truth is not in us. No, we made him alive. The truth is not in us. If we say that we have no sin, as well, we read that in first John one. That's what we been talking about. Come on. And made higher than the heavens. So this man was made or created, but he was higher than the heavens. So we know this ain't no regular priest. This can't be no son of Aaron. What else? Who needeth not daily. As those high priests to offer up sacrifice. Whoever this person is, who's holy, on who's home, on holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, may hide in heaven. He don't need to offer sacrifices every day like those Levitical priests did back then before he came in the flesh of the world. This person is separate from them. He can take with whatever. He don't need to again to need. He don't need to do those daily sacrifices. As we read it like Numbers 28. You don't have to do that. What else is he saying? To offer up sacrifice first his own sin. Remember, he's undermined. First, he's he's separate from sin. So he don't have to sacrifice for his sins like the Levitical priest did. And what else? And then for the people. What people is he talking about? The children of Israel, the Israelites, our ancestors, our physical, our physical ancestors. I did a video call uh, on my channel when you first come to us called Who's the Jews? Watch that documentary and learn who is he talking about? Who are the Jews? I'm actually going to do a series on this. I might write a book on this as well called Who, uh, Who's the Jews? All right, let's continue. And then for the peoples, right? for this he did once. For this he did once. This Christ did once, but he did what? When he offered up himself. When he offered a sacrifice himself. Come on. For the law maketh men high priests, right? which have infirmities. So the law he's talking about is not the whole Old Testament preachers. He's talking about the sacrificial law. But the word of the law. Oh, law. It said the law maketh men. It appointed men to be high priests. Was have what? And pharmacy. That is a weakness, a sickness in that. That's a flaw in it. But what else? But the word of the oath. The word of the oath. This is what we talking about earlier in this chapter. Come on. Which was since the law. Right. Make if the son. Makes the son or appoints the son with what? Who is con consecrated, consecrated or holy forevermore. Forevermore, meaning he was a perfect sacrifice. That's what Galatians 3. That's right. Galatians chapter 3, verse 19. Galatians 3 and 19. Now remember, guys, you write down once again Romans 5, verse 8 through 11, and we know when we read about that, it talked about how in the past we were the enemies of Christ, we were the sinners. Christ died for us. And they tell you that much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. But it also talks about how we joined in God in Christ. Uh, whom we have now received the atonement, the sacrifice, which leads me to this right here. Remember earlier when we read Leviticus 16 and 16, where uh matter of fact, we grab this first real quick. Leviticus 16 and 16, when it says, and he shall make an atonement, which is a sacrifice for the holy place, because of what? Because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel, and because of their transgressions and all of their sins. So, atonement was put in place for the transgressions. That was the law that was put in place or added in case you went off and committed a sin. So, if you committed a sin in order for you to be forgiven, Leviticus 120, an animal had to die. Blood had to be shaped so that you can be forgiven or pardoned for your sins. But now we have the application of Christ, who is the propitiation, who is the reconciliation, who is the atonement, who is the mercy seat, who is the sacrifice, who is the mediator, the savior. Come on. Galatians 3 and 19. Paul's about to ask a question. Pay attention, preachers, that y'all love to read. Matter of fact, read 25 first. Book of Galatians, chapter 3, verse 25. 24, 25. 24. 
Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster. See, the law was our schoolmaster. We don't have to keep it anymore. To bring, to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. We already read about being justified by faith, right? But then St. Paul say in Romans 3 31, do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid, yeah, we are sound the law. Come on. Verse 25. But after that, faith is come. We are no longer under a schoolmaster. You could still read this and think that that's saying you don't have to keep the law of God anymore. Shameful God. And if you're a preacher teaching that, sit your behind down and repent. Yeah. Right now, I'm doing a talk. You've been lying to your congregation or church. I'm going to look. I'm going to talk to any preacher, any pastor, any bishop, any deacon. If you are a, a, a Christian going to any congregation and you showing your preacher, your pastor this video, and if he tell you that young man don't know what he's talking about, don't let him talk. Say, hello, let me put you in touch with him then. Reach out to me. If you can't find me, go to propolybook.com and book me. All right? If you just so happen to can't find me, comment on this video. YouTube.com says, do the shooter. I'll talk to you, preacher. I'll talk to you, pastor. We can talk. We ain't going to argue, but we can build. I got questions. Allow me to put your preacher in a hot seat and ask about these, these scriptures since I'm wrong. Let's do it. Any preacher, any 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 at any time, let's make it happen. Don't sit there and say, "Oh, that young man don't know what he's talking about." All right, we'll prove it. Let's see about that. So, if you Chris is watching this, look, I welcome you. I welcome you. I'm not gonna beat you down or none of that. We can have a nice, godly conversation. I'd rather have it through Zoom so I can share my screen like when I'm doing now. You know what I'm saying? I'll only do it if we're gonna do it on video. I get to see everybody's face. Come on in, I'll drop a Zoom link and we can talk about it. This is extended to the church because y'all need to repent. Fully accept Christ. That's right. Fully accept Christ. Y'all got to believe that, but hey, it's a little more though. Y'all almost there though. Y'all ain't wrong about everything, but you're wrong. Romans 3, I mean, Galatians 3 and 19, what does say? Paul asked a question. What question did he ask? Wherefore, uh, then serveth the law. Look at that. He asks, wherefore, what? Then serveth the law. The key word is serve. Wherefore, then serveth the law. In other words, what purpose did the law even serve? What was it there for? What purpose did the law serve? Now, the church would read this and automatically first and ignorantly assume that this is talking about the entire Old Testament. But it's not. Read that again. Wherefore the serveth the law, wherefore then serveth the law. It was added. It was what? It was added. Say that again. It was added. It was what? Added. Added. It was an addition. It was added. So this, so whatever this law was what? Added. added. There was a law that was added. But why was it added though? Because of what? Because of transgression. Because of what? Because of transgression. Because of what? Transgressions. Hold to on. The, hold on. Uh, okay. It was added because of transgression. Remember, First John three and four says, "Whosoever commits sin, transgresses also the law." But sin is the transgression of the law. So here he's essentially saying. There was a law added. that was added because of sins. What Christian pastors, what was the law that was put in place or added in case the children of Israel committed a sin? What did they have to do in this law? What were they commanded to do? If you don't know, it's okay. Let me help you with that. Atonement, sacrifice, Leviticus 16 and 16. They did this so they could be forgiven. Leviticus chapter 4, verse 20. The blood represents the life. Leviticus 17, verse 11 and verse 15. This reconciled them back to God. Second Chronicles chapter 29, verse 21 through 24. They did these things. 
before Christ came, they have to believe that those priests were able to sacrifice and have faith that the priests did their job so that they could be forgiven. That's what justified them back then. But the deeds of the law, the works of the law, don't justify us. And that's the sacrifice. We're justified by faith. Faith in who? Christ. Who is what? The atonement. The sacrifice. The Passover. The first fruits. Oh, don't get me started. So let's continue. Verse 19, one more time. Wherefore then, serving the law, it was added because of transgression until we did. To the seed should come. Notice it said it was added because of the transgression until the seed should come. Who is the seed of the descendant? Read verse 16 to find out who is that. Matter of fact, I'll read that. It says, Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He said, Not and to seeds as of men, but as of one, and to your seed, which is Christ. Christ. So it's saying here, what was the purpose of the law? It was added because of sin, so Christ should come to whom the promises were made. Who was the promises made to? Israel. He children in of Israel. And then it said, and it was ordained or established or appointed by angel in the hand of a mediator. That is First Timothy 2 and 5. First Timothy 2 and 5. This is what it says. First Timothy 2 and verse 5. It says here. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man. The man Christ Jesus. So it was a mediator. But then it goes on to say in verse 20. Now media is not a medium of one. God is one. He asked a question. Listen up, preachers. Is the law then against the promises of God? What law is he talking about, preachers? I'm going to give you an answer. It was added because of transgressions. What law is that? The sacrificial law, the law of atonement. It's asking, is atonement against the promises that God made? Because remember, this was set in place to the seed to come to whom the promises he made. So he's asking, is animal sacrifice against God's promise? It says, God forbid, meaning by no means. Then it says, but if there had been a law given which should give life, verily all truly righteousness should have been by the law. What law? The law that was added because of transgressions. I'm like that. So when you look in verse 21 again, if that had been a law given that could give life, now who gives us life, y'all? Christ. If that had been a law given which could give life, verily righteousness should have been by sacrificing animals. That's essentially what he's saying. Verse 22. But the scripture, remember, we read letters. Paul is writing a letter. These churches will go to Paul's letters to try to keep them out of these commandments. Even Paul is acknowledging the scripture. He's acknowledging the Torah and Tanakh, which we call the Old Testament, basically. It says the scripture have included all of the seed. What do we read that in the scripture? Daniel chapter 9, verse 4 through 13, Ezekiel the 18th chapter. When you read about Israel transgressing the law, so notice it says the scripture I've concluded all under sin. Sin is what? The transgression of the law. But the preacher said, we don't have to keep that line no more. If that's the case, then why does the scripture conclude that we are breaking the law? Why does it conclude that we all understand? If the weight of sin is death, and sin is the transgression of the law, and we said that we all understand, that means sin is still in the world. Sin still exists. Sin is the breaking of the law. 
Paul is still acknowledging the law of God. But you gotta be having your faith not in those priests anymore, but in the high priest who was holy, honest, undefiled, separated from sinners, and made higher than heaven, who need not daily as though the high priest were to offer for his own sin to be for the people's. But this he did once when he offered up himself, as we just read the Hebrew in the second chapter. So it says the scripture has concluded that everybody has broken the law of God. That the promise by faith of Christ might be given to them that believe. We still have some, well, back then they had some people that did not confess Christ, that did not want to come to Christ, that was not of this fault. We still have that. Still have that. They knew and understood that they were Israelites. They knew about the law, but they didn't want to put their faith that he, Christ, would be mercy to you. He would be the talk. That's what this is about. Then it says, verse 23. Verse 20. You want to read it? Yeah. Verse 23, but before faith came. But before faith, what? Came. Came, meaning Christ. So before Christ came, come on. We were kept under the law. We were kept under what? Under the law, preachers. Question. Before Christ came, who exactly was kept under the law? I'll give you a second to think about that. It said, before faith came, read that again. But before faith came, we were kept under the law. We, that's formal. We were what? Kept under the law. Who was the law given to? Who was kept under the law? The children of Israel. It says we were kept what? Under the law. What law is he talking about though? The law that was added because of transgression. This is a long story short. I gave you Leviticus 21. I gave you 2 Chronicles 29, 21 and 20. I gave you this. We were kept under the law. Come on. Shut up, you unto, shut up. <laughs> shut up unto the faith. So it was closed up unto the faith, or it wasn't, it was hidden until the faith came in other words. Come on. Which should afterwards be revealed. Which shall what? Afterwards be revealed. He was the Lamb of God, the sacrifice, the atonement, which was revealed in these last times for you. For example, when you look at 1 Peter. Chapter 1. First Peter chapter 1, verse 19. It says, For with the precious blood of Christ, as of a land without blemish and without spot, who verily and truly was foreordained, was selected before the foundation of the world, but was manifest or revealed in the last days, the last time is for you. So here it is. It says, Which should afterwards, which afterwards be revealed. Come on with me. Back to Rome. I'm glad you left. Verse 24. I should have had left. Oh, that's all good. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. Read it again. Wherefore the law, what? the law, what law was he talking about? Remember, he said here, what was serving the law that was added in terms of transgressions, that animal sacrifice, atonement. Atonement was a schoolmaster to what? To bring us unto Christ. Remember Leviticus 16, when he said that for I, what was saying that he was going to be in the presence on the ark? He was a mercy team. All these things got us prepared and ready for Christ. These things brought us to Christ. It was a shadow of things to come. As you read in Hebrews 8. Come on. That we might be what? That we might be justified by faith. That we might be what? Justified by faith. One more time. That we might be what? Justified by faith. Then in Romans chapter 2 verse 13, he also said, but not the heroes of the law, but just or righteous, in the presence of God, 
phân tử chúng quy luật tuần hoàn sinh diệt trở và này tôi nhớ tuần trước tuần ba và chú nói là rất khó đối chúng ta thì quá ít rất ba nên chỉ biết là bây giờ cái số anh muốn thì sacrifice nào you will forgive Christ will forgive you gotta believe that you gotta have faith in that come on but after the faith after that faith is come we are no longer under a schoolmaster. No longer under a schoolmaster, meaning a teacher. We know what it is now. We know what it is now. We know who our propitiation is. We understand that. We understand how? Because when we look at Romans 5 and 8 again, it says, when God committed his love to us, is that while we, we were yet sinners, bring God law, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his love, we shall be saved from wrath to him. So we're justified by faith, we're justified by the blood of Christ, and we're justified by the law of God. We're justified by the law of God. And that's why it says in verse 10, but then when we were enemies, we were reconciled or brought back to God. We were reconciled to God by the death of the Son. Remember, what he was not a tether had to die. Much more being reconciled or brought back, we shall be saved by his life. Remember, the life of the flesh is in his blood. But it said that not only so, but we also join in God through our Lord, the Shua and Shia, and the whole Shua and Shia, the Jews and Prophet, uh, when we have now received the atonement. So when we look at this word atonement here, let's put on that exchange. Remember, uh, we in debt to Christ. He oh, he paid the price for us. He paid the price. The restoration, atonement, reconciliation. See that in the New Testament, the restoration of the favor of God to sin, which means breaking God's law. They repent and put their trust or their faith. In the expiratory of the death of Christ. The death of Christ. So that being said, remember, I'm at youtube.com slash so do the shoot. Y'all got any questions or comments? That's on the topic. Action questions. And uh, before we end, so remember earlier we learned the words of atonement to cleanse, to purge out, to forgive, to disannul. Setting aside, right? We understand that, right? We know that we can't be forgiven for our sins if we don't forgive others, right? Y'all understand that? So if anybody has ever wronged you, anybody, you must forgive them so that your sins can be forgiven. That means you let it go. It never happened ever. And your actions will show what it is that you believe. What it is that you believe. If anybody watched them, I ever wronged you, forgive your brother. And if you ever wronged me, I forgive you. It never happened. That's true forgiveness. That's true repentance. When you afflict your souls, you humble yourself. You judge yourself. You correct yourself. And if you're not doing these things, not forgiving people, then why are we here? Why are we doing this? It means nothing. It means nothing. That's the long story short what this day is about. It all points back to Christ. Who is our sacrifice? Who is our atonement? And if you Want to be forgiven for your sins, Christ? You gotta forgive others. Come on.